quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have a few quick announcements before we start. Our town meeting will be asked to make a few changes in the order of articles taken up this evening. For Article 18, we have a main proponent here early tonight, so it would be asked if we could begin with that one. Also, town council says that the attorney most familiar with our proposed zoning bylaws is here tonight, so it would be advantageous to take Articles 13 through 16 up immediately after Article 18. Assuming that we do change that order, we would then return to where we left off on Tuesday with Article 4. Since much of the debate on the substance of the article was already taken up Tuesday, I would ask that we try not to repeat everything that's already been said on Tuesday night. Now, now, now Mr. Brown, do you, you have a motion to take Article 18 out of order? So moves. There's a second. Second. All those in favor of taking Article 18 out of order, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Brown. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, it's, is it exactly like it's in the... Uh, yeah. Okay, then just begin discussing. Thank you very much. Good evening. Okay, we can read that. Uh, shortly after graduating from Reading Memorial High School, Frank began a tour of duty with the Marines in Vietnam where he was awarded the Purple Heart. When he was discharged, his tour of duty was not over. He became a firefighter. Frank served... 20, over 20 years as a custodian of the soldiers of Sailor's Grave and devoted many hours to see that each and every uh, of the 2,300 2, veterans in Running Sports Cemeteries had a flag, a flag holder, a fl flower placed on their graves each Memorial Day. When he retired, his tour of duty was not over. He served as Reddingstown Veterans Agent. Along the way, he served on the Recreation Retirement Board, the 2007 High School Rededication Committee saw a proper disposal of all United States flags. Everything Frank did, he did 110% on everything. And as expected, as I found out, he expected no less from those that worked with him. Shortly after Memorial Day last year, Frankie's tour of duty on this earth ended, and a new tour of duty began. And if you believe the Marine Corps hymn, he now stands guard in heaven. I can see him, full-dressed blue uniforms, an M16 on his shoulder, and his flip-flops on his feet. Uh, Mr. Moderator, may I ask permission for his two daughters to come forward? Yes. Is there any objection? None appearing? They can come forward. Come on down. I don't know if his brother wants to come down or not, but that's all. Good evening. I am Stacy Driscoll Hall. I am one of Frank's daughters, his oldest daughter. My I, sister. I'm Caitlin Driscoll Salmon. I still live here in Reading. I'm his youngest daughter. Um, so we've prepared a little something to share with you. Bill has eloquently told you a little bit, so forgive me if it's redundant. Um, Frank Driscoll was the quintessential townie. He was born in Stoneham, Massachusetts, but moved to Reading before he was nine years old. He attended schools in Reading, Pearl Street, Coolidge, and RMH of class of 66, of which he was very proud. He lettered in three sports at Reading High. Uh, being Re a Reddingite was something that he was extremely proud of. Friends of ours who didn't know Dad, but upon hearing about him, came to know him as Mr. Redding. Whether it be on the Little League ball field as a 12-year-old or enlisting in the United States Marine Corps straight out of high school, Frank always looked out for the little guy. He began training at Paris Island in August of 66, and by January of 67, he was in Vietnam serving his country. Dad did two tours in Vietnam, where he was awarded the Purple Heart Medal. When Frank returned home, he briefly worked outside of Reading, where he met our mom, but quickly realized public service was his true calling. 
Dad worked a short stint in North Reading Fire Department, but in 1974, he joined Reading uh, Fire Department, where he spent the next 29 years as a firefighter and EMT. He also served as union president for many years. Dad always went the extra mile for everyone he worked with to make, sh people sh make sure people got their fair share. Upon his retirement from the department in 2003, Frank needed to keep busy. Any of you who know him know that's true. So he started working part-time as the town of Reading's veterans agent. Always working for his military brothers and sisters, it became his full-time passion as he devoted countless hours ensuring his veterans had every need met. While not part of this position, Dad also spent 25 years as the custodian of soldiers and sailors' graves, taking great pride in his very last year where he didn't miss one grave. He was always researching and creating maps to remember each veteran. He felt honored to be able to do this work. He liked to keep busy. Dad never shied away from being involved in Reading's youth athletics. When Mim Jarima needed coaches and referees, Dad read field hockey manuals so he could help. Over the years, he coached various sports ranging from popcorn or football, basketball, and his beloved softball. Frank also became actively involved in volleyball, being the Volleyball Boosters president. He attended town meetings on the regular, was a booster, and was on the recreation committee. Softball has always been a fun pastime for Dad, playing many years in various men's leagues and fire department teams. Despite working several jobs and going to night school, when his girls became old enough to be involved in softball, that meant Frank was involved in softball too. Mrs. Jarima had an influential force in getting Dad involved with writing youth softball. It didn't take too long before Dad was an active member of the board of RYS. He ran Reading Youth Softball for about 25 years, first as a coach, being a division president, and finally the chairperson. He always made playing softball possible for any player, from finding sponsorship for players who needed financial assistance to driving kids to and from practice, things you couldn't do these days. Reading Youth Softball consumed Dad's, life's, Dad's life. He prepped and lined fields, obtained equipment, recruited volunteers, organized schedules, secured umpires, and watched more games in one week than most people do in a season. Once spring ball was done, it was on to summer teams, and he was always coaching, sharing the love of the sport. That didn't complete him, though. His dream was to coach high school. Prior to earning that opportunity, watching those games each weekend paid off, allowing him to scout some serious talent in Reading. Dad invited players and held tryouts for an all-Reading tournament team for girls in the under-12 circuit. The Reading Rage was born. Dad and I coached the summer team for several years, on which my sister played and my mom was a true supporter. All but one or two players were from Reading. It was something he bragged about. Our home field at Birchie saw sprints, push-ups, softball drills that did not resemble softball drills, more like military drills, <laughs> rundowns, rundowns, injuries, cartwheels and handstands, anything to motivate his girls. A small family was created on that field. That's what my dad did. He created family on the field. I honestly don't know how long he ended up coaching for the junior varsity softball team at Reading High School. He got to see his girls from the original Rage claim the Division I state tournament. He worked tirelessly for all the girls and boys of Reading. He developed bonds with families that lasted the test of time. So many people and their families came to pay their respects at his wake, a true testament to the impact my dad had on so many softball players. It would be, the only, fitting, it would be only fitting that at this point the town of Reading be naming the softball field for our dad, considering how much time, effort, and energy he spent dedicating his life to fostering the love of the game in others. Thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Brown, you have more? Or you want to oh, okay. Further discussion? None appearing. Spe we speak up or we will hold your peace. <laughs> so seeing none, we are, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. One thing I... Uh, One thing I would like to do before we continue, uh, as I've stated before, when we have instructional motions, which are not taken up until the end of town meeting, it's good to get the motions out early to give whoever's being uh, instructed 
some semblance of uh, uh, notice. So I have two already that will be taken up at the last night, whenever that is, the end of the last night. The first one is the select board shall instruct town staff to join mass green communities in 2020 or take other equivalent action to achieve ongoing energy improvements and a plan to begin implementing significant renewable energy solutions in Reading and report the progress updates at each annual and subsequent town meeting. The second one is move that the town instruct the select board to adopt post haste a town-wide policy that includes at least the following elements. A commitment to strengthening our municipal forestry department to enable expanded tree plantings along the roadways and in off-roadway locations and expanded tree maintenance services. A ban on the clear-cutting of land proposed for development and a heritage tree program pr to protect large mature trees from unnecessary rem removal. And again, those will be taken up at the, at, as the last business of town meeting. At this point, we have a motion from uh, Ms. Alvarado <laughs> to take articles 13, 14, 15, and 16 out of order, in that order. Is there any discussion? None appearing. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. We now go to Article 13. And let's see, uh, Mr. DeRezzo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tony DeRezzo, Associate Member of CPDC. Move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw as follows. One, by inserting into section 5.6.5.3 in appropriate alphabetical order, a new definition as follows. Hemp, as defined in MGL chapter 94G, section one. Two, by deleting the definition of marijuana in its entirety from section 5.6.5.3 and inserting in place thereof a new definition as follows. Marijuana, as defined in MGL chapter 94G, section one. Is there a second? Second, Mr. DeRezzo. Thank you. The reason for the change is basically that m medical marijuana is only allowed in the industrial district for now as a registered dispensary. Medical uh, marijuana establishments, retail marijuana is not allowed in town at all. No, pro, no changes are proposed to these regulations. What is proposed is allowing for marijuana, um, CBD and non-tetrahydrochlorine cannabinoid marijuana products to be sold. Uh, the definitions in town are extremely broad. They eliminate all marijuana sales. Adding the separate definition for hemp would allow such non hallucinogenic products to be sold in town. If we adopt the MGL chapter 94G definitions, we will keep up with the state. Uh, we will actually be able to eliminate all marijuana as our definition in town currently only covers a specific strain of the marijuana plant. If we adopt this zoning regulation, Marijuana will not be allowed to be sold in town anywhere, but the non-hallucinogenic version of marijuana, hemp, CBD, et cetera, will be allowed. If we make no changes to the zoning bylaw, 
CBD and the hemp and so forth will simply not be allowed to be sold in town. The current definition, as you'll see, refers to cannabis said via L. The state refers to the genus cannabis covering all cannabis plants. So there is a small loophole that could be used to sell some versions of marijuana in town. This is the Massachusetts General Law Chapter 94 definition. It's very similar to the current definition we have under the medical marijuana dispensary, except as you'll see that it has the genus cannabis, not the set via L version. Hemp is listed as 0.3% or less of the tetrahydrocarbon oil concentration in marijuana, allowing CBD and hemp to not be classified as marijuana by the state. Once again, if we adopt this resolution, uh, marijuana will not change, but we can sell hemp and CBD products. Do we have a CBDC report? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, moderator. CBDC report. On Monday, June 10th, 2019, CBDC convened to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 13. All documents were made available on the town website. The public hearing was held to provide an opportunity for comment and to determine whether the provisions of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment shall be adopted by the town. The June 10th, 2019 public hearing was opened at approximately 8.45 p.m. and closed after discussion. Any comments received at the hearing were included as part of the record of the hearing. On June 10th, 2019, the CBDC voted 5-0 to recommend Article 13 to town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Just re oh, yes, I'm sorry. Ms. Webb? Uh, Elaine Webb, uh, Precinct 1. Uh, I just was wondering if there was any and maybe, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but the police department or RACASA, any weigh-in or, or guidance to town meeting on this issue? Do we have any comments? Uh, not appearing. Um, okay. Any other further comment? Oh, do we have one? Oh, oh Mr. Malasha. All I can say is our CASA, the board, has not discussed this issue, so there's no recommendation. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote, but uh, I will try a hand count first, and if it's unanimous, I will declare it as such. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And we have one. Okay. Do I have my counters from uh, Tuesday night? Mr. Brown, Mr. Crook, uh, Mr. Patino, and Ms. Hillary. Thank you. All those in favor, please rise. Twenty-eight. Twenty-six. Twenty-six. Forty-four. Is that microphone on? <laughs> 38. And those opposed? Zero. Zero. One. One. Zero. Zero. One. One. The vote being 136 in favor and two uh, opposed, the motion carries. Business under Article 14, Mr. DeRizzo. Thank you. Uh, move the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw as follows. One, by deleting note one and all references thereto from section 5.3.1, table of uses for business and industrial districts, and renumbering existing notes two Mr. through Mr. six. Mr. DeRizzo, does everybody have an exact copy of this? I believe so, yes, Mr. Okay, Mother. then we will dispense with the further reading, and you can uh, discuss it. So Article 14 is basically a little cleanup on footnote one. 
Footnote one is an amendment to the table of uses that allows for single family homes built before 1942 with eight habitable rooms at that time to be able to be converted to a two family provided that they retain the appearance of a single family. The goal was originally to allow for the larger older homes to remain intact and be a part of the character of Reading. Uh, we need to fix uh, first a small uh, mistake that we made when we did the recodification back in 2014 where we had the footnote applied to uh, single family instead of two family. It also was applied to business A where two families are already allowed so the footnote was unnecessary. So the new, uh, the new footnote will read that in a residence district, a single family dwelling existing prior to 1942, which at that time had at least eight finished and habitable principal rooms, upon receipt of a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, may be converted to a two family dwelling provided that the conversion does not increase the gross floor area of the structure by the lesser of 1,000 square feet or one third of the gross floor area of the dwelling existing on the date of application for conversion or January 1st, 2020, whichever is earlier. And that the external appearance of the existing single family dwelling is retained. After the structure is converted uh, to a two family under this footnote, no further additions to the structure will be allowed. At such time that the original pre-1942 single family dwelling is voluntarily demolished, rights to a two family under this footnote, whether granted by right prior to November 2019, or by special permit shall be discontinued. Part of the problem here was that uh, we had developers coming in saying, well, I can build a, turn it into a two family, then tear it down and build the two family I wanna build. So just let me tear it down now and I'll build my two family. Why put me through the extra expense? Uh, negating the entire reason for the amendment so that we retain the original house and we retain the aspect that it looks like a single family. So it would fit in the neighborhoods properly. If we adopt this resolution, there's a cap on the additional square footage. Sometimes re developers were looking to add two, three thousand square feet to make these McMansions two family. Uh, the ZBA will make decisions on footnote one. Right now, virtually every two family conversion is going before the Zoning Board of Appeals because there's something that the developer wants to do that the building inspector says is not allowed. Uh, the special permit process will be required for conversions and that will cover and make sure that uh, the neighbors are notified, nothing happens in the back rooms, in the dark. Everybody will be notified and there'll be a public hearing. Okay, we have a CPDC report. Oh, thank you. Uh, CPDC report on Monday, June 10th, 2019. Uh, CPDC convened to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 14. All documents were made available on the town website. The public hearing was held to provide an opportunity for comment and to determine whether the provisions of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment shall be adopted by the town. The June 10th, 2019 public hearing was opened at approximately 9 p.m. Any comments received at the hearing were included as part of the record of the hearing. The public, was hearing was, the public hearing was continued to Monday, July 8th, and again to Monday, August 12th, to allow time for further discussion and public input. The public hearing was closed on August 12th and the CBDC voted 3-0 to recommend Article 14 to town meeting. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Um, it seems to me that the last addition that you put on there goes against uh, what we're trying to do in this town. And with the creation of uh, uh, in-law apartments and accessory, the uh, need, the reason for that was to pr provide low ho housing. Um, I grew up in a two-family house, and I would strongly suggest that as long as somebody builds the same house on the same footprint, I have no problems with it. It's not going to increase the density of anything. It certainly may not increase the number of children that we have. If you tear it down and put up a McMansion, if you say, uh, you can end up having four or five children in a McMansion on a two-family house with only two bedrooms and either, each thing. You're, you're pretty limited to the amount of children you're going to have. And I think over the time that I was in the building from 1935 to 1950, 
my father rented out the other apartment. I don't recall ever having any children there. So it's just three children in town. So if you tear it down and do not allow it to be built on the same footprint, you're going to be ending up with more children uh, in the school system, in my opinion. The uh, zoning bylaw, as stated, is designed to come into, com into parity with the in-law apartment. That's why we are limiting the addition to 1,000 square feet, which is what is currently under the in-law apartment um, bylaw. The goal here is these are not zoned for two-family. They're actually zoned for single-family. If you were to tear it down today, you'd be able to build a single-family. In the attempt to retain the character and heritage of many of the buildings, we're allowing for the extension of that building into a two-family. Further discussion? Mr. Mon? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Just a, a clarification and then possibly an amendment. We say we can increase the square footage of this dwelling by up to 1,000 square feet. Yet then we say we cannot change the external appearance of the existing single family. I'm having trouble understanding how you can increase the square footage by 1,000 square feet and not change the external appearance. But I, I think I agree with the intent. So I would, uh, so I would uh, propose that we amend that last line of paragraph one instead of saying earlier and that the external appearance of the existing single family dwelling is retained, change it to earlier, and that the external appearance of a single family dwelling is retained. Because I think the intent is to have it still look like a single family home rather than a McMansion or an apartment building. But I just don't think it's possible to add a thousand square feet and have it look the same. So I would propose that or offer that amendment. Is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second? A discussion on the amendment, the proposed amendment. Yes. Mr. Arena. John Arena, Precinct 1. Tony, do you know approximately how many houses would be subject to this off the cuff? Uh, there was a GIS study done for the town. Approximately 900 homes in town may qualify. Uh, we still would need to actually investigate whether they, the eight rooms were principal rooms and habitable in 1942. But there are 900 homes built before 1942 with eight rooms or more currently. And is it practical to know today what conditions were in 1942? Is that a reasonable thing to know at this point in the game? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Thank Arena. You, um, the building commissioner quite frequently assesses properties okay. um, to see if they qualify under this footnote, and I have not heard any problems okay. from him in doing this. And, and for those like me with a light bulb just went on, this is an attempt to, in, in an environment where the house would come down and a larger house would be built, a single family house, this motivates a, a, either the owner or a contractor to keep the facility, maybe double the density, with two families to preserve the character of the home. That's really the trade, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's right, correct. Thank you. Okay, we're discussing the proposed amendment. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Yes, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Jeff Struble, Precinct 7. Uh, just a friendly amendment, if I may, uh, grammar. Shouldn't it be that, uh, if it's going to read, and that the external appearance of an existing single family dwelling is retained? To add an in, would the, would the, uh, would the uh, mover accept that amendment? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure, I just want to make sure we have it exactly right. Okay, we got it. Okay. Further discussion on the amendment? Yes. Ms. Schneider. Gina Schneider, Precinct 5. I just wanted to check with the writers of the footnote. 
it, does this conflict with what you were trying to do with the wording that you had in there? I don't feel it conv conflicts. I believe originally um, the original zoning was for an existing uh, single family. The goal here was to try and keep it more to the original character as opposed to allowing you to basically rip down the front of the building and rebuild it uh, and losing some of that charm that it might have had. By using the existing building, uh, you're, you're giving them a goal to hit, and because it's going before ZBA, this is going to be a special permit. The zoning board can make a determination whether to maintain that, frontage, that front space or grant a variance that would allow the applicant to therefore make a change. So I'm just wondering, uh, Jamie could speak to his amendment, but wouldn't it be better to say to, and that the external character of the existing single family dwelling rather than, I mean, the way this is, now the amendment amends it, they could do anything that's a thousand square feet, including tear the front off. Whereas if you're just trying to keep the character it, it's the reason why we left the word the in there instead. Uh, the other goal is that the thousand square feet sounds like a lot, but really it, uh, when you start using it for hallways, uh, foyers, staircases, it starts to eat up that thousand quickly. So am I, am, I, am I hearing that you think this will work? I believe it will work. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? None appear, oh, yes. Mr. Wise. Uh, Tom Wise, Precinct 3. My interpretation of this, of putting it to and existing, makes this more subjective as opposed to objective. There's an objective measure of looking at the house mm -hmm. and saying I'm maintaining that external appearance going to your intent, it sounds like, from what you were explaining versus an existing is a little bit more subjective and provides arguably more leeway, which might be good or it might be bad. But it seems as though the intent, and I agree with the previous speaker, of the character of the, of the existing house is where you're trying to go and makes it more objective as well for the ZBA going forward. Subjectivity, from personal experience in de dealing with the ZBA, very, very challenging. Objectivity makes it much more you know, black or white, for lack of a better way to say it. So I'm personally opposed to this change, but would consider something where it says external character of the existing or something along those lines. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion does not carry. Uh, now we're back to the main motion as originally made. Is there further discussion? Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Vaughan, Precinct 4. Listening to my colleagues, I would propose a, an amendment to change appearance to character. That way we maintain the uh, objectivity. My concern is, is uh, similar to Mr. Mr. Wise's, that if we are not specific, I, I could make the argument that adding a thousand square feet changes the appearance of a house. I would have trouble arguing that adding a thousand square feet to a pre-1942 house, which is rarely more than 2,000 square feet, would not change the appearance. But you could add a thousand feet without changing the character. So uh, uh, learning from my colleagues, I would propose that amendment. Is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second. Thank you. A further discussion on this proposed amendment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Joe Carnahan, Precinct 6. Um, two comments in relation to the, the, uh, the proposed amendment here. Um, one is that, uh, um, building on what Mr. Wise said, um, appearance seems more objective than character to me, so I'm not particularly excited about this amendment for that reason. Uh, also, since there seems to be some question about how you could add a thousand square feet or just add any living space without changing the appearance, I'll point out, uh, just maybe I'll put this under your question. Uh, if I finish a basement or I turn a garage into living space, that adds uh, square footage, correct, without changing the external appearance? Is it? 
That one I would have to defer to uh, the building inspector. It depends on how the basement and the garage were originally classified. Okay, but if they were not classified as living space and they turned into living space, that would, that would do be it. one example. Okay, thank you. Further discussion, Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. It's also worthy of noting that if you had this hypothetical 2,000 square foot house, you could not add another 1,000 to it, you'd be limited to 667 square feet additional under the one-third rule, but. Further discussion. Mr. Wise. I can see that the expert over there is about to chime up as well, but there's a difference between net and gross to your question. If I you know, finish a basement, that's changing my net square feet, not my gross square feet. And this definition is gross square feet. If I dig out a basement and there was nothing there before, I might be adding gross square feet versus net square feet. So you can, to your point, but it's a much different thing and a much more, much more difficult thing in that particular case. Further discussion? Yes. Talbot. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Dave Talbot, Precinct 5. Also, thank you very much to Julie Mercier, who was in town hall today. And I own such a house on Linden Street, and she was kind enough to look at my folder and sort of explain the situation to me. The more, the, the more fundamental um, question I have about this is that basically what it does is for 900, I guess there's 900 or 800 of these houses, previously, as of right in the zoning code, it could let you use it as either a one-family or a two-family. And now you have to get a, a, a special permit from the, from the zoning board to use it as a two-family. And I understand that if, if it's deemed to have been already in use as a two-family, you would not have to get such a, a permit. But it seems to create a pretty big new requirement for houses like mine and I guess 800 others in the town. And I wonder why we, I, I get the, the spirit of it, I get what you're, what you're getting at. Why did we have to add this requirement that you need a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals to, to do this? Why can't we just have the other tweaks that you've made? My understanding is that almost all of these are going before the ZBA because the developers are looking for an extension. They're looking to add two garages off to the side. They're looking to increase the square footage by doubling it. Okay. Uh, what we're trying to do is to give the neighbors the opportunity to speak it, to uh, have their voices heard because it will be uh, noticed yep. and it'll be actual hearing yep. as opposed to all, all of a sudden you have a two family next year. I get that. So what about situations where the house is just, it looks the same, the only thing that's happening is maybe a kitchen is being added or removed within the building so that it becomes a one or a two and that's my situation. Um, but you're not changing, you're not adding to it, you're not doing any, any additions, any changes, but the internal stuff is changing. But you're saying I have to go to a special permit to the ZBA for that? Uh, do you mind if I make a couple clarifications to some statements that have just been made? Okay. So first of all, Dave, thank you for your questions. Um, I thought that what we had agreed to today when you came into the office was that your property actually does not qualify for this footnote because it currently is an existing two-family structure. Correct. So this footnote does apply to two-family structures existing today if they were converted from single families to two families under this footnote at some point. Um, and I believe that that was not the case with yours, although Correct. I could be mistaken. So um, I just wanted to clarify that for anyone who's in the room. And then the second thing is <clears throat> currently they are not all going to the Zoning Board of Appeals. <clears throat> we had one that went to the Zoning Board of Appeals because the building commissioner issued a decision on it that the applicant did not agree with. And so we appealed that decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And that actually gets at exactly why we're here and proposing a special permit process, which is that this was becoming quite cumbersome for staff to negotiate over the counter because the current language in the bylaw is fairly subjective and unclear. And we were, ha we were coming across many instances in which contractors were trying to push the boundaries of what we felt comfortable was you know, meeting what we felt was the intent of this bylaw, which is to preserve the you know, older, larger, existing structure, you know, um, keep it largely recognizable as what it has been for many years, but allow it to be carved up into two smaller units. So rather than negotiate these things across the counter um, and allow a change to a neighborhood um, without a public process, we thought that this would be well suited to be dealt with by the Zoning Board of Appeals 
um, through the special permit process, which they already use um, for most accessory apartment applications. So it does require notification to abutters, a public hearing, and um, a little more transparency, um, and it gives the zoning board a, the ability to um, listen to concerns from abutters and, and weigh the pros and cons, and it's not a decision that's being made at town hall. I, I have, may I follow up briefly on this? Because yeah. I'm, oh, thank you. Um, so thank you for that, I understand. And, and thank you, by the way, again, for looking at my folder and taking the time to do that. I'm actually not here not just for, for my own property purposes, but I know a lot of people who have these big houses, and at one time they would have had the ability to say, put the you know, big 3,000 square foot Victorians you know, around the downtown, whereas previously they could have added the kitchen on the second floor and you know, a doorway and had a two family, um, and maybe it was a single family, and all they did was add a kitchen in an existing big, big house and then create some affordable housing. They could have done that before with a building permit. No, not, the, not the developer big addition thing, just adding a kitchen. And now they have to get a special permit from the ZBA to do that. Is that, is that what's not what's happening? So um, I think that what's, you know, that is possible. What you're saying is possible. What we're seeing actually is um, not just adding a kitchen, it's adding, you know, thousands of square feet to the structure as well. Um, we might not be here tonight if most of the applications that were coming in were not increasing gross floor area of the then, structure. Then can we edit this, um, to, and I don't want to do this on the floor because it's hard to edit zoning on the floor, but make it that that's what, where people are trying to add and add additions to these buildings is where this would be triggered, but not where there isn't an addition being made because I know a number of places where additions aren't being made, but you could be putting a burden on somebody um, when they're not trying to do an addition on something offensive in garages. They're just trying to do what they thought they were always able to do. Do you have any specific proposed language for well, how we I get mean, there? Right, right now, we are still discussing the proposed amendment well, to change okay, well the I word guess, okay, appearance I to. Uh, I thought I was account. allowed to talk about the overall. I guess my edit would be to cut out the phrase where they have to get a, a but then that would hurt your intent to cut out the requirement for a special permit. I, mean, I guess sit down at the end, wordsmith it. So give me a minute, of, and I will. Well, l let's go back to discussing yeah. the change from appearance to character. Is there a further discussion on the proposed amendment? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment changing the word appearance to character, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion does not carry. We're back to the main motion again. Further discussion? Yes. Nancy Toomey, Precinct 3. I'm also a local architect and actually deal with these structures on a, a lot of basis. Uh, just back to the former uh, person who was speaking, one of the difficulties with converting a old Victorian house to a two-family is that because it's never been a two-family, it needs to have all the fire rating, it needs to have two means of egress from that new apartment, um, it needs a lot of modifications. It's not just adding a kitchen. So part of that modification is trying to get a stair, that a second means of egress up to wherever that apartment is, making sure that it meets code. It's extremely difficult to do that within a box that's existing. You'd have to do a lot of renovations and uh, modifications to it. So it's fairly unlikely that you can do it within its box. So I am a strong proponent to having a special permit in this process. I think it helps to clarify not only to the neighbors, but uh, to the town what the intent is for these additions. So I would really strongly urge you uh, to accept this as it has been written. It, a lot of thought has been gone into this, believe me. I've been there with, those, with the CPDC. Thank you. For the discussion. Yes. Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3. Um, I just have one question, and it deals with the limitation. Basically, this law, or this bylaw, seems to indicate that at the time you convert, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, 
you might have the ability to add up to a thousand square feet, but you may choose to say add only 500 square feet. And I just wonder if it should be reworded in order to um, say that you can add up to a thousand or one third of the of the gross floor area um, period such that if you convert the convert the house over and you know and you can do it by adding 500 square feet and it was a big house that later on you can come and ask for the additional 500 square feet I don't think there's going to be many cases where that you know turns up but it seems that if we're going to do this effort it would be good to uh, consider everything there. Ms. Mercer. Thank you Mr. Moderator. Thank you Mr. Foster. Um, that's a good question. It's actually one that the CPDC discussed at length um, and we did originally have language that you know didn't cap the amount of special permits someone could get for additions um, but there was a fear of you know creeping expansion of a structure to the point where it really does no longer resemble the single family um, appearance or character of that original structure and so they felt that a cap would be um, a good thing to put in place um, especially where we would be handing this to the Zoning Board of Appeals it also gives them another parameter to work with um, so that you know if they were getting one special permit application and then two years later another and then two years later another you know I mean that wouldn't happen but if that were to happen like with different language in the zoning article, it would be very hard for them to decide like when is enough enough. So we thought we would decide that for them. Um, that being said, if someone wants to exceed something that's allowed in the bylaw, they can always apply for a variance. Could, could they apply for a variance then in, in the case that I described? Yes. Okay, good enough. Further discussion? Yes, in the far corner. Eric Fournier, Precinct 6. Um, I just have a question, and it's really more to sort of a working definition of what are you constituting as a two-family versus a single family with maybe an in-law apartment. I think I've heard some of the speakers here tonight use the term, you know, an apartment, and, you know, it's somewhat confusing to think about, okay, are we splitting houses up into a duplex type of a situation versus me adding on, you know, in-law apartment for my in-laws, so to speak. So if you can just sort of speak to that, I think that'd be helpful for the folks here. Sure. Ms. Mercer. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Cormier. Um, so that is a good question. And I think that we look at this a little different, this two-family conversion a little differently than um, the accessory apartment conversion, even though some of the parameters are the same, like the square footage parameters. Um, with with this two family conversion, they could add, someone could add a thousand square feet to the house and then carve it up into two identical units. Um, whereas the accessory apartment really is pretty specific that the existing principal single family structure um, is the you know, larger unit. Um, the accessory apartment is smaller. Um, with regards to um, who lives in these units, we don't weigh in on that. So um, you know, tenancy type isn't really contemplated here. Um, and then neither, I, I will say again, that existing two family structures, whether they're a two family that's a principal with an accessory or a two family that's a duplex, like neither of those situations would um, fall under this footnote unless the conversion had happened because of this footnote in the past. So does that answer your question? Any else said? Okay, further discussion? Mr. Talbot, you have a amendment. Thank you. I have promised. Um, thank you for the reaction comment. The, the one reaction to that is that if somebody's doing work on their property, they have to get building permits and those have to meet code and that's where you are going to meet your egress and other issues. So I don't think you need a special permit in order to meet building code and exit issues. M most of these old houses also have back staircases. The, the, the tweak that I would add is that if there's no addition being made to the house, People shouldn't have to go with an extra burden of getting a special permit to do what's been in the bylaw for, for decades. My addition would be right where the cursor is to say, however, if um, 
if no addition is being proposed, then no special permit shall be required. Meaning no, if no square footage, you know, whatever the word would be, if no additional, thank you. If no increase in square footage is proposed, comma, the special permit requirement is waived or is not required. So that just means people who have buildings, they're not changing it, they're just doing what they can do. They're gonna have to meet code anyway when they do what they're, they're gonna do. But they're not gonna get a, a hassle or have to go through some new burden, burdensome process. And we can keep and maybe create affordable housing. All right, let's just wait till we get it up there. Thanks. Is that right. correct? Is that what the, your proposed amendment is? That, say, that seems pretty good to me. Okay, is there a second? Yeah. Second. Further discussion? Thank you. Ms. Binda. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I've never gone through the process, so what what is the burden of going up getting a special permit. Is it time consuming? Is there a cost to it? Can you explain what that is? Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Binda. A um, little bit of everything. There is a time component. Um, the time component is largely driven by the state statute for special permit notification, which requires um, publication of a legal ad in the newspaper. Um, one of them has to publish at least 14 days prior to the hearing, um, and then notification to all the abutters. So there is some lead time involved in queuing up the application so that staff have time to make sure we comply with that process. Um, the public hearing opens with the zoning board. It could take one meeting, it could take a few meetings. That's you know something that is different for every application. Um, at the close of the public hearing, the zoning board issues a decision. They have a certain time frame in which they're supposed to do this. I believe it's 14 days. Um, and then once the decision is issued, there's a 20-day appeal period. So usually what we tell people is the special permit process is no less than three months all told. Um, and the cost is, is nominal for the actual application for the preparation of plans and hiring of consultants, engineers, attorneys. Um, it, it could, you know, become substantial. So that's so three months, but and what would, it, what would the time frame be if it were just to get a permit to put an addition in? So um, under the building code, the building um, inspectors and commissioner have up to 30 days to either issue a permit, deny a permit, or ask for um, additional information. Um, and in the town of Reading, we actually tend to turn them around much more quickly than that. Um, I think something like 80% was with one or two days. Um, sounds about right, okay. Yeah, okay, so. but it could be the difference between one month and three months. That's correct. Ms. Herrick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Karen Herrick, Precinct 8. Just a point of information, does the special um, permit survive a change in ownership? Ms. Mercer. Um, I believe the answer is yes. I defer to town council. Yes. Well, I, unless it's specified that it runs, that it, ah, you did it. Uh, town council. As a general rule, special permit would stay with the ownership of the property, but there could be a condition included that it be limited to the um, a particular owner. Mr. Talbot? Just to reply briefly, yes, it's three months versus one month, but it's also the ZBA can say no. If there's, it, it creates a new hurdle. It, it's actually a very big difference, and it's not just a, a few thousand dollars in three months. It's a zoning board of appeals is a legal body, and if there's a neighbor who doesn't like what you're doing, even though you're allowed to do it, and they cause you a headache, they can, ZBA can vote it down, depending on the caprice or the opinions of the board at that time. So right now you can do it. This would mean a way that you would be stopped from doing it, uh, to do a two family where it's been allowed for decades in a house that's not being physically changed. Continuing on, continuing on the uh, proposed amendment, further discussion? Okay, yes, Mr. Bard. Want to uh, talk first or okay, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Mears, sorry. Uh, Tom Weiss, Precinct 3, once again. Um, this may be a friendly amendment or it may not be necessary. It well, may we, be have, we have an amendment. Oh, you mean to this, to this to existing, the amendment. Okay. existing one, yes. Yep. Um, in particular, the, the word square footage, 
again, going back to gross versus net, you may change the net square footage, but they think the intent is to not change the gross square footage. And so maybe it should change square footage to gross floor area, but I would defer to Mrs. Mercer and, and, and Mr. and Ray, so. <laughs> Mr. Ray. Mr. Mayaris. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, it's really important if you mean the same thing to use the same words so everybody knows that you mean the same thing. So that's a, that's a good change. I was actually going to make and suggest something else. Um, it's not just that the special permit process is not required. It, it should, the word process is not what you want there. You just want the special permit would not be required. So you might, you might suggest. Um, Are those changes uh, acceptable to the mover? Yes. yes. Any objections to changing that motion? And then appearing. All right, back to discussing the um, proposed amendment. Any further discussion? Before we make sure we have somebody else. Okay, Mr. Wise again. Sorry, this is not a change anymore, but really just to address the question before about the special permit itself and how arduous it is. I would say it's extremely arduous. Um, having been through it multiple times, it's not a small hurdle to jump over at all. Um, and three months may be nice, but if you have to continue it, it may be six months, and we're talking sometimes $5,000, $10,000. It's, it's not a small hurdle, and it's not easy uh, in any way, shape, or form. So from personal experience, I'm on board with this personal this, this change. It does not change the character. It does not change the neighborhood. I like this, uh, this amendment personally. Further discussion? Anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Mr. Talbot? Oh, I, okay. Mr. Talbot, then I saw one up the back here. Sorry to keep bouncing up like this. I just wondered if gross floor area has a legal meaning uh, versus just, we're just talking about the buildings looking the same. I mean. Can you get closer to the microphone? Just wondering if the term gross floor area has some legal meaning, whether the space is heated or not heated or whether it's. You know, we're talking about the spirit of this is that the building is looking the same as it always was. Ms. Mercer? So that's all I'm wondering. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. Um, gross floor area is defined in Section 2 of the Zoning Bylaw. Um, I will read the definition. The sum of the areas on the several floors of a building or buildings measured from the outside surfaces of the exterior walls at each level intended for occupancy or storage. So it's exterior walls in. It's like all in. So if somebody's taking an unheated uh, attic space and making a room that's meeting code, that would be not... Changing. That would be an increase in net floor area, okay, in so net, net livable space, but... There yeah. we go with the net versus gross. Right. Thank you. I saw a hand in the, in the bar. Yes. Hi. Christine Lost, Precinct 5. I'm just wondering about how many of these um, instances come up each year. or how many of these permits would have to be pulled per year as a result of this change, approximately? Do we have an answer? Because I guess my, I guess my concern is that we're taking um, work that our paid town hall staff are doing and we're putting it onto a volunteer board and I'm just wondering how much additional work we're gonna put towards that board and if it's already a long, arduous process, if they become overworked, does that become a longer more arduous process. Ms. Mercer. Um, thank thank you. you, Mr. Moderator. I'm sorry I missed the very beginning of your question, so let me know if I don't answer everything you've asked. Um, so the staff actually do a lot of work preparing packets and working with applicants before things go to the board. Um, we did meet with the zoning board to talk about this change, um, and they were on board with it, with us making it. Um, we got some feedback from them, which we incorporated into drafts that were reviewed. Um, but I do believe they're, they are, um, in support of what we are proposing tonight. Does that answer your question? You, you asked uh, approximately how many? Is that, is, do we have an answer on that? How many permits um, there are a year? Yeah, I believe we've um, looked at probably half a dozen of these in the last year or two. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Bond? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4, and this is just a question. Does this proposed amendment apply to conversion into a two-family dwelling 
whether it still be one property on the tax rolls or whether it's converting a, a property into two condos, which would be two properties on the tax rolls. Does it apply to both situations? Ms. Mercer. Can, sorry, can you repeat that question? So you could convert a single family to a two family and still have it just one property. Mm -hmm. Or you could take a single family and convert it into two condos, which would be two properties with two different deeds. Does this apply to both situations? Yes, I believe it would. We don't regulate tenancy type and zoning. I'm sorry? We do not regulate tenancy type and zoning. So this would apply to both? Yes, you could convert it into um, two spaces that have one owner and who rents both spaces, or you could convert it into two condos and sell them individually, yes. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Tronello, Precinct 8. Doesn't this proposed amendment mean that the entire middle portion of the amended bylaw should be struck? It already says if the, if the conversion does not increase the gross floor area of the structure by the lesser of 1,000 feet or one-third of, of the gross floor area. And now we're saying if there's no increase to the gross floor area, you don't need a special permit. Wouldn't be, if, if we're in favor of this amendment, shouldn't we just strike the middle part of that? All the way up to existing on the date of application rather than the amendment? Um, isn't, it, isn't it kind of in conflict? Thank you, Mr. Carniello. I, um, I hear what you're saying. I, the middle part of this proposal is setting the parameters for someone to be able to convert through the special permit process, um, which you know they can add gross floor area, but they can't increase the gross floor area by more than a thousand square feet or a third of the existing um, existing dwelling. I think what Mr. Talbot's proposing is the instance in which there's actually no increase to gross floor area at all through the proposal and then no special permit would be required. Um, but am I missing something about your question? No. Okay. Okay, further discussion on the proposed amendment? Not appearing, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and the motion carries. Back to the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Wise. This might be the only one I talk on tonight, so I promise I'm almost done. Um, logistically, 1942, you say it hasn't been a problem. Um, however, in the previous incantation of the in-law in in related uh, in apartment um, issue, there was a 1982 related clause, and that was tremendously difficult. Um, I had to use Board of Assessor documentation, for example, and even using that documentation, the ZBA questioned the validity of it. So I would wonder how April 1942 can apply uh, logically and reliably and what town documents exist to prove it that a, that a homeowner could use and rely upon. Um, and just as a, a case, for example, in my particular case, there was a 1982 house and then they closed in a back deck which made it a 1997 house. And I had to go find exactly what the house was in 1982, again, which the only, only town records was the, was the assessor documentation, which was then refused as accepted documentation by the ZBA. So logistically, I wonder how well this can be managed and where the documentation is to support this claim versus saying as the house is now, and unfortunately that then makes the rest of it challenging at best. So if you could talk through how that documentation is maintained and where somebody may find such documentation. Ms. Mercer. Sure, so that's a difficult question to answer, but thank you. I think that without knowing all the specifics of your application um, and without knowing you know, every um, detail that the building commissioner looks at when he assesses properties to see if they qualify under this footnote, um, I would say that it, it, and without being an architect too, so I'll defer to um, anyone in the audience who wants to add more or disagree with what I'm saying. 
um, that it's possible that the building materials and the foundations that were put in place dating back to that time were significantly different enough that it's not um, pre presenting too many challenges for our building inspectors to make the determination. I have spoken to them on numerous occasions about this footnote and about their assessments of these properties and they have never told me that they've had any problems um, determining if a structure qualified under the footnote. Um, so we do have a number of sources of documentation and information at Town Hall that, that they can use if needed, but I do think they, they largely rely on a visual inspection um, of the property to make this determination. So um, please help <laughs> if anyone has. Okay. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? Yes, we, oh, do we have a question? Okay. Stephen Cool, uh, Precinct 6. The text says that the external appearance of the existing single family dwelling is retained. If you're converting a single family to a uh, two family, you might need to add a door or make some other modifications that do alter the external appearance of the existing dwelling. Uh, and they may be aesthetically pleasing, but it seems that this, the text, the way it is presently written, would preclude you from, uh, let's say, adding that external door. So uh, if, uh, if you agree with me, then I think we might want to uh, insert a word, say, uh, the word substantially before retained. Mr. Moderator, is this an official um, am amendment? Just, just about to ask that. I was just making sure we had it down. Are you, make, are you proposing that amendment? I do. Okay. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Discussion on the uh, proposed amendment? None appearing. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We're back to the main motion again. We have a point of order. No. Amendments only require simple majority for proposed amendments, yes. The, the ultimate vote would be uh, two-thirds. Okay, we are back to the main motion again. Any further discussion? None appearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, two, two questions. Um, it says, when the dwelling is voluntarily demolished, and I wonder if there's such a thing as an involuntary demolishing, like if it burns completely, would they then have the right to, um, you know, you know, to rebuild the two families? We actually discussed that. The answer is yes. If it burns down, it's not your fault. If it's destroyed by a gas explosion, heaven forbid, it's not your fault. You should have the right to rebuild the two families. Okay. Um, and second question. Um, do the makers of the motion want to revise the parentheses near the end saying prior to November, um, whether granted by right prior to November 2019? Because now um, I think it can be granted by right if it's not enlarged. Um, so, so, so one of the, the amendment we just made might affect that, um, you, know, you know, granted by right prior to 2019 or by special permit. So, so, so it could be granted by right at any time if it's not enlarged, but I'm a little confused about the wording there. Sorry, can you clarify? Are you <laughs> confused by the proposed amendment um, or by we, the wording it, right above it? So, so, so we just made an amendment that you don't need a permit in some case. And then the, that last line says, um, granted by right prior to that date or by special permit. But now there's a case where you don't need a permit. Yeah. Then it would be granted by right. If you don't need the permit and it's allowed, then it's granted by right. Okay. Do you still want it to say parentheses prior to November 29? A 
Okay, I, if I understand you correctly now, they could be granted by right after November 2019 because now they do not have to go for the special permit. I'll let, uh, I'll let you think about that. Yeah, that's correct. Further discussion while they're thinking about that? Yes, in the middle. Hi, Kevin Leet, uh, Precinct 1. So <clears throat> the substantially retained question, I think we have to go back to that because as it's described right now, you have the option to make the house bigger without changing the exter external appearance of the house. Straight up, this is not Harry Potter, so how are you expected, <laughs> how is anyone expected to ex make the house bigger and keep the exact same external structure appearance? Um, I think the key here, and I'm not an architect, but my understanding that um, you can make a variations to the external structure. You're trying to keep it looking like the two family as it appeared. You can add a door, but you can't make it a main door that when you're looking at it, you go, oh, that's an entrance and that's an entrance. No, just like a side door to a regular home, it's part of the wall, it looks like a win, it, sure. it looks similar to a window. So there are minor modifications that can be made while still retaining the original appearance. Just as if you changed your windows in your house. It still looks like your house, they may be a little bit bigger. Now, if you turn them into an entire glass wall, that's a huge change. Right. And that's one of the reasons why you'd have a special permit. But changing windows doesn't add square footage. No. So how would you, ex how'd you expand square footage of a house and keep the single family dwelling appearance retained? Because I think there's substantially retained or what, whatever the previous amendment had put up seems to explain that answer pretty easily and doesn't actually change the function of the bylaw. Right. Um, yes or no? But that, but that amendment has failed, so. I, can I put in a different word? <laughs> like, I, cause no, right, that right would, now this doesn't, so. That, that would constitute reconsideration. Irrespective, no, I would not of, that, irrespective no. of that amendment, yeah. right now as this reads, I don't see how mm -hmm. anyone could get this through the now three month process of not changing the external appearance of their house if someone decided to make it an issue. Okay, so right. that's Business a really mission. good point that you make. Um, Don't say but. <laughs> I believe the goal of this is to add additional, allow the addition of massing to a structure in a way that um, scales up or is kind of, is. Um, absorbed into the existing structure, which is part of the reason that the allowable square footage is tied to what's existing today. So, sure. you know, if the bigger house you have, the more you can add, because the more you can hide things into corners, nooks and crannies, ba the back. Um, so um, what we have seen is some applications really that maintain sorry, the facades along the street and kind of build the massing towards the back. Um, and that has, we have considered that acceptable. But this, again, gets at the subjective nature of this, which is better handled by a board than town staff. Um, and I did not personally disagree with the addition of the word substantially. <laughs> that out there. Okay. I okay. Further discussion? <clears throat> People who have not spoken yet? Okay, Mr. Wyatt. Oh, did we have another one? Am I missing something? Oh, yes, up there. Okay. Officer Garcia, Precinct 3. Um, I have a question on uh, continuing, I guess, the, our wording. At the very beginning in the first, sent uh, first sentence, we end with prior to April 1942. If we jump down to where we talk about voluntarily demolished, we just say pre-1942. I'm just wondering whether we should include April in there somewhere. Well, if you think the four months between January 1st and <laughs> April is significant. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, please. Pre 1942, add the word April before that. We will accept that as a friendly amendment. How's that? 
Well, I would ask for a second on that, oh. and then uh, is there any discussion on that? There may be people who are not. Uh, is there any discussion on that proposed amendment? All right, all those in favor of adding the word April, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Okay, Mr. Wise? Oh, is it, sorry, Mr. Friedman. I'll get back to Mr. Friedman. Mr. Wise, go ahead. Call on you. You are right. <laughs> okay, we are, we are still discussing the prior to November. All right, uh, further discussion on that proposed amendment? Um, who's, whose hand is up? Okay. We are now talking about the prior to November amendment. Right. Okay, further discussion on that? Uh, none see it. Okay, all those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Okay, but we're back to the main motion now. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, Nick Boyvin, Precinct 7. So I have a, a proposed amendment here to try to address this substantially question that was considered before. Okay, so how can we do this? The comma and that the external appearance of the existing single family dwelling is retained. That phrase I would like to amend as follows. And that the external appearance, drop the cursor, and then start hitting the delete button. So in delete of and the, no, delete the other one, sorry. The external appearance as a single family dwelling is retained. Insert as, nope, please stop. As a single family dwelling. So insert as. Uh, no, it's a different, different word. I'm thinking about well, I'll leave that for the moderator, so thank you very much. I, I am going to allow it. It's, it is close, but I'm going to allow it. It is a little, it's substantially different, so I'm going to allow that proposed amendment. So we'll now discuss that proposed amendment. Is it, yes, Ms. Webb. Elaine Webb, Precinct 1. I think that I support this amendment because we've been struggling to try to, I think, correct this. It, it, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people here. It's evident that you could add up to 1,000 square feet and not change the external, external appearance anywhere on the structure. There's nothing in here that talks about you know, the front or the street side. So I think that we, this is at least the fourth try at this, and I support it. And I think that I um, appreciate Mr. Bobbin's assistance. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Cynthia Cool, Precinct, precinct 6. Um, it seems as if anybody can just, if they already know that this exists on the record, they come to you and you say, they say, I want to add on to the back of my house. I want to put 2,500 square feet to my home. And they're not going to put a second family in there. And you say, OK, go ahead. And then a year later, they come back and say, we want to convert this into a two-family home now. So I mean, at what point is it to bring this all forward? Because it seems as if you can just go around it. It's a loophole. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. You don't have to use law. Mr. You're, ab you're absolutely correct. That was a loophole. That is why we have the date in there that basically says, as of <clears throat> November 2019, that's the size of the house that you can convert to a two-family. Uh, I'm sorry, January 1st of 2020. Sorry. So, so if today you go in and you convert it, or what, what I'm saying is you're already adding more than a thousand feet onto it. Okay, it's already done, and then you say I want to. It's already bigger. I want to make a double-family home. So yeah. what happens in that case? They wouldn't be allowed to make the double-family home unless you reduce the size of the property. So if you go in and you double the size of your property with 2,500 square feet on February, and then in March you come back and say, now I want to convert it to a two-family, 
you no longer meet the requirements here because you've extended beyond the size as of January of 2020. Just to add to that, if I may, that is precisely why we have a start date. So a date that like on this date, as the structure existed, mm -hmm. um, that is exactly the reason for that. Okay, so then. All right, so let's say you, you still, you, you built it up. So you're saying if I put more than the lesser of 1,000 feet or one third of the property space. If I already built it more, you will never be able to turn it into um, uh, turn it into a double family home, okay? Unless you reduce the size of the property. Otherwise, well, um, what my question is: If we don't vote on this, then they can do whatever they want with their home. Is that right? If we say we don't want this, does this does, is there still something in the record that? Stops the family from stops the family from working on their own house and doing whatever they you know want with the back of their home. Um, okay, so that's uh, two questions. I think if someone were to make an addition between uh, make an addition to their home, a home that would qualify under this footnote, if someone made an addition to it and then decided later they wanted to convert to two family, but they'd exceeded the square footage what we would do is recommend they come in for a special permit and a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals at the same time. Um, I'm, I can't say w whether that would be granted or not, but that would be the process we so would recommend. So there may be a way to fit a bigger home into this somehow, if it was granted. No, because it goes back to, like you said, January 2020, is that right? Right, so. A variance wouldn't get around that. If you want to exceed the limits that we are proposing in this bylaw, you can uh, apply for a variance at any time. Okay, all right, that was part of the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other part is, um, the other part of the question was, um, if we don't vote mm -hmm. on this, can the person do whatever they want? And just forget it, do your variance, get your property done, and then do it in two steps. I wanna turn this into a second home. I want, I want another dwelling upstairs, and uh, you know, we don't want that to apply. Let's say we don't we don't want to deal with this okay. one third, so, one thousand feet. We can just right. say no to it, and it's gone right. away. Is that right? That's that's why we're here tonight. It's up to you to decide whether you want whether this amendment or not. Whether we want to limit these people right. in S their in their additions to right. their homes. Right. So Correct. for homes that qualify under this footnote. I want to make that clarification so it's not Correct. limiting any single family homeowner in town. Right. It's homes that qualify under this footnote. Right, and I, I um, think it's I, I think it's it's bearing um, a lot of responsibility on the homeowner to go through the process, to go through the neighbors and, you know, mm -hmm. it I don't know that it does any good to put all these restrictions on the property owner. Um, I don't see what good it does when the person can just go and ask for a variance person can just go and say, I would like to make a two family home. I mean, why all why all the details? What is the what is the what is the meaning of all the details? If Sorry, they, what is what I don't I don't understand why it's being done. If they just want to build on their home, why can't they? They're asking um one second. Um, I was just going back to the background in the warrant to to see if it would have some helpful language that I could point you to. Um, it does explain the impetus for the change. Um, right now, homes that qualify under this footnote, owners come in, and if they want to add on, that's fine. Um, it's it, what triggers this review is whether they want to convert it to a two-family. Um, so someone who owns a home that qualifies under this footnote can um, apply for building permits, increase the gross floor area as long as they meet current zoning setback um, and dimensional regulations. If they don't, there's a process that they can go through with the Zoning Board of Appeals already in place. Um, so we're not proposing limits on what people can do with their existing single family homes. We are proposing limits on what can be done if that home is converted to a use that is not um, 
to a two-family use that is um, not widely permitted by right in single-family zoning districts. So it's a sp it's, if, if you have a property that qualifies under the footnote, you're considered more or less a special case, um, and you, can, you are you know, allowed to convert it to a two-family. Um, the current wording of the bylaw is, is unclear, and it's challenging for staff to, as you can see, how long have we been talking about this? It's very challenging for staff to negotiate these things over the counter um, with homeowners and developers and contractors. Um, and so we wanted to establish some parameters for what could be done here. Um, and we aligned them with what can be done for accessory apartments, which is another provision of the bylaw that allows a single family home to add an additional unit. Yeah, um, I don't understand the square footage um, oh. on it. I don't think it really should be a restriction, um, automatic restriction on the building of, let's say they want a two family home. I, I, I think that putting that restriction on is um, too restrictive. I so think that that mm -hmm. should be uh, done individually, case by case. I think that, you know, if they want to build it, make the home bigger, they should be able to. That's just all that I say. I don't, I don't know if I want to change the way it's written at the moment, but I, I, I just think it's restrictive um, to the people that live in the homes if, if they want to build out, you know, in the back of their home or something. Personally, that, that's all. I, I, don't, don't know if I, I, I don't know if I agree with it 100%. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Ms. Lander, did you have your hand up? No. Further discussion? Uh, any people who have not talked yet on this? Uh, Mr. Sasso? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, I guess uh, as much as I understand there's some consternation over this particular piece of the bylaw, uh, I'm certainly not in support of changing it, only because it does then open it back up to the it being interpreted that they could basically demolish it and recreate it again to, in a, in a single family dwelling appearance that may not necessarily have been the one that was there before. Um, you know, maybe legally that's not exactly what our intent is, but changing those words, at least in my mind, views uh, changes that view. Um, normally, and and maybe just correct me if I'm wrong, if I recall, when you create a special permit process there are often guidelines that are generated separately. So I certainly think that that's a better place to put some of what we are grappling with than in the bylaw. So maybe you could talk to that a little bit because I know in the past when we've done special permits at the CPDC, we've, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a prior CPDC member, but um, the issue was that we would provide a, uh, a guidance document for staff and for um, applicants as well. Um, and I think this is an area that would be uh, much more applicable. Thank you. Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Sasso. So that's a great point that you make. Um, and in some cases, when we establish a special permit process for a use, we do establish separate special permit parameters. Um, in this case, we didn't. But we do have general special permit parameters in Section 445 of the Zoning Bylaw that apply to um, any special permit and when the CPDC or the zoning board or the, whatever the special permit granting authority is, um, <coughs> there are parameters for them to use as they review a special permit. Um. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Strubel? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Strubel, Precinct 7. Uh, this is a question about unintended consequences of this amendment. Um, if it reads uh, and that the external appearance uh, as a single family dwelling is retained, does that mean you forbid the use of two front doors? And is that the intention? <laughs> Ms. Mercer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Stubel. So that is something that we have been working with over the counter with applicants on so that it c the property can maintain the appearance of a single family structure. Um, and it, it is quite challenging to figure out where to locate that second entrance. Um, and then, you know, usually there's actually two means of egress for each unit. So um, it can be quite challenging, but it can be done. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it is one of the challenges that would be better um, 
weighed by the zoning board of appeals. I guess my question is: is, it, is the second door, second front door forbidden in this in this amendment? Um, no, it is not. Okay. Mr. Mon. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct Four. First, I think that Mr. Sasser raises an excellent point that these these guidelines can be developed by the zoning board of appeals or through general requirements. But this proposed amendment does not change that. That still applies. They can still work to develop their specifics within this. And then back to the preceding uh, comment, if this apparently does not preclude two doors, two, two entrance ways, however, the original language, which prevents the change of the appearance, that to me is more adaptable to, to preventing two doors. But on the, the, the larger issue, the intent of this, which I fully support, is to prevent building an apartment building in the middle of a residential zone, something that looks like an apartment building in the middle of a residential zone. That's what we want to prohibit. And I think that this proposed amendment does prohibit that from happening and still fully allows the addition of a, of a second entrance or a kitchen on the back as long as it doesn't look like an apartment building. It still looks like a single family. So I fully support this amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Brown? Peter Brown, Precinct. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'm against the amendment. I see it as, uh, I, it, if there's a house and it has a certain appearance, I think the goal is to keep that house with that general appearance. If you say that as the appearance as a single family dwelling, to me that means that the house's appearance could change significantly and I think that is against the intent of the original motion. So I'm against the amendment. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Mr. Arena. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. Uh, Ms. Mercer, uh, this would not preclude the use of, say, a 40B to um, tear the existing building down and build a multi-unit subject to all the other compliance. Is that correct? Um, yes, that is correct, Mr. Arena. 40Bs can go in any zoning district in town. So it, this really is, a, is attempting to prevent the narrow case where the owner of the single family unit um, sells it to, uh, to a developer, to a, another individual who chooses to extend it or tear it down and build a, another single family home. That's the only instance it's really aimed at or do I miss it? And by motivating uh, the appearance of a two family, it prevents the expansion of the existing single family into a McMansion. Is that the motivator? Um, we didn't specifically talk about avoiding 40 Bs with this, but that would be one. Sorry, I, ch I changed my, my so 40 okay. Bs are still mm -hmm. in play. Mm -hmm. This is really aimed at say, taking an existing single family and, for, and motivating the um, owner not to tear it down or sell it for or tear down and rebuild. Yes, that's correct. And the motivator is to say you got a better outcome by having two mm -hmm. properties. But at the end of the day, you end up with two properties that may be a thousand square foot or larger versus uh, with, with two families versus a single building, which arguably would be larger, but the question is, what is it larger than a thousand square feet? So I'm not sure that the net impact to the neighbors is necessarily an issue. You do keep the building, but in terms of the intensity of use, it's definitely up with two families. So there is a consequence to this if it were, go th if it were to proceed, and I guess the moderators at six houses a year, potentially, if I understood your earlier comment, would be affected. Is that correct? Um, Yes, there is a consequence, and the increase in density is one of the reasons we felt that this should be discretionary and should be by the Zoning Board of okay. Appeals. All right, thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. I think the 1,000 square feet limit is too restrictive, in my opinion. Whether you want to keep, if the person wants to build onto their home, they can do it. They, they can. 
This is we're talking well, about the amendment, the proposed amendment. Just the amendment. Yes. Well, your increase. Well, okay. So, is, it, do not increase in gross floor area. Okay. Can I clarify? Then, is the amendment we're discussing the the addition we of the words as a? Yeah. Okay. We're just discussing the blue part then Correct. at the moment. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, the, a piece of that blue part. As a. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought we were working on the whole clause. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Then appearing. All those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the moderator is in doubt. All those in favor, please rise. I assume I still have my counters. Yep. Ten. Ten. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. And those opposed, please rise. Twenty-three. Ten. Ten. Sixteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Seventeen. Eleven. Eleven. The vote being 83 in the affirmative and 54 in the negative, the motion carries. M Mr. Moderator, would you ask those that want to vote, please sit in front of the aisle, not behind the aisle. Point taken. If you want your vote to count, you need to be uh, on this side of the aisle. We are now back to the discussion on the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I just want to take out the January 1st, 2020 part on it because if somebody wants to go through and extend on their home and it gets a variance, I don't think that should preclude them from in the future creating a two-family home as long as the exterior is not, you know, substantially changed at that point. You have a I would like to take that off. Okay, what exactly is your proposed amendment? Let's make sure we have it. Um, if they've already built onto the home and it's not, they're not building today as a two-family home. They just want to extend the back of their house. Right, but what is your proposed amendment? I would like to take the restriction off that dates it back to like January 2020. So, um, so that if they build on the home first and they're approved for a variance to build, you know, they want to build, I don't know, more than a thousand, let's say. I'm just saying off the top of my head, it might happen. Well, but that person should be able to get that variance. And then in the future, why are they precluded from having um, a second family uh, home? I, I think that's too restrictive on the owner. Okay. As do, long as the do we have your Do we have your proposed amendment correct up here? Yes, yeah, somehow take that. The well, I need it on. exactly. It's, it's sort of like a grandfather. If they've already built on, let them. And if they want, correct. To get the I two need. Family. I need to know exactly what you're proposing as your amendment. Okay, let me read it. Let me see. Yeah. Is this is this the way? Just strike out. Strike out the date, please. I think we can do it with striking it out. Is I just don't, I want that anybody who's already built as of today or tomorrow or next week to be grandfathered, grandfathered in. And then if they still want the double, the, the two family, they should be able to apply for it. Okay, is this what, is this what you're proposing? We just put in blue. Yes, just take the date out. I think that's really, the, the January 1, 2020 restriction would allow the homeowner and the, yeah. Yeah, the date of the application. Yeah, take that out and right. let I need, them. I need exactly what you want to do. I, I'm asking yes. you. Is, uh, I'm not opposed to what's up there. I'm not opposed that if you want to build a two family and you want to restrict it, that's fine. But for the people that want to build out onto their home, let them. 
And then if they want to come back and have a two family, it's already done. Why make them take it down? Let them. If it goes through, it goes through. Is there a I second to this proposed amendment? Yes. Okay. Continue. Okay. That's it. All right. I think that I think it, you have it right there. Okay. Further discussion on this proposed amendment? None appearing. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Back to the main amendment, main uh, motion as amended. Further discussion? All right, this requires a two thirds vote. Uh, all those in favor of the main motion as amended, please rise. Twenty-eight. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. Forty-eight. Forty-eight. And those opposed, please rise. Zero. 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 Mr. Zero. Moderator, can I make a request that people are coming down and standing in the aisle so I don't know whether they're on this side or that side. So if you're going to come down, could you please get over to one side because they're coming down. Good point. It's, uh, this is, it's hard on the counters. Please decide which side you're on when you're coming down. You should be sitting down here. Uh, we have one more vote to come in. Mr. Brown. Oh, he did this already? Was it zero? Four. four. Okay. The vote being 136 in the affirmative and four in the negative, the motion carries. That brings us up to Article 15. And the, the motion before us will be under Article 15, but 15 and 16 are linked, so we can talk about both of them together. But any proposed amendments can only be done in 15 at this time. So, Mr. Um, Weston. The motion? No, I can just. No, only if you have changes to what's in the no. printed thing. Yeah. No, that's not. So you can just discuss. All right. Um, great. On to another zoning amendment. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, as we were talking about the last one, um, well, two, a couple things crossed my mind. One is uh, thank you for all your time. Um, uh, zoning, as, as was obvious over the past hour, is, is complicated stuff. Um, but I do think that it impacts um, each and every one of us, um, all our, especially the ones that impact residential um, developments. It, it, it's about our neighborhood, so it's, um, it's important. And, and thank you um, for your time and, and patience. Um, this, uh, this article is all about um, the, uh, primarily about the South Main Street area. Um, uh, the challenges um, in, along South Main Street um, uh, is that um, one of the, the um, primary ways of that, that um, investment is being made in Reading and in other towns um, is with mixed use development. That is, uh, residential, I mean, um, retail or commercial on the on the first floor, uh, residential on upper floors. That's what we see happening here in Reading, as you you all are all aware, and what we see happening um, in in other places. The other um, type of development that's happening a lot, you'll see it, you see it everywhere, is just flat out residential development. You see it next to every highway in every town in Massachusetts. Um, we want to make sure that we preserve our commercial, um, our commercial districts. Um, that has been something that we've focused on at CPDC. Um, we have 
uh, as you all know, our, our commercial district is very small, um, uh, very small, um, but very important. Um, and so we wanna make sure that, um, that we set up zoning so that uh, that, that, um, that commercial district is um, A, first invested in, um, but B, also not converted to uh, more residential uh, residential property. So, with that as the background, um, this is why we, we looked at um, uh, making some changes to the um, zoning, um, uh, primarily uh, that, that runs along uh, South Main Street, um, and looking uh, at clearing up the rules around mixed-use development. Um, right now, uh, there are, you, you are allowed to uh, to develop uh, multifamily housing. Um, you could combine multifamily housing with, um, uh, in the same structure uh, with, uh, with some commercial development. The regulations are very uh, convoluted and so complex to be able to do that, really, you, you can't make your way through those. Um, and so we wanted to make it clear what the regulations are in, for both town staff for CPDC, for ZBA, and for, um, for the town, so we know what we, we might be getting. So I, I'm gonna try and keep this um, high level. I'm sure that once you all have questions, we'll dig into the detail, but I may um, uh, skip through um, some things. I don't wanna take up um, uh, more time and more patience um, than we all have. So uh, mixed use, combination of uh, residential and commercial uh, in the same building or on the same property. Um, we want to make sure that we we clarify um, uh, what the zoning um, uh, can be used for. Um, uh, w so we're introducing a new category um, called mixed use. Um, it's not in our table of principal uses in the past. Um, it, it is in um, uh, allowed through our zoning overlay districts, but not specifically um, specifically in our, our table of uses. Uh, we would look to have uh, mixed use um, allowed through special permit in business A and in business uh, C. So where are those? Uh, business A is generally um, along South Main Street. There's the little section of business A up where Home Goods is. Um, and there's a little section of business A, uh, what's that, the gas station, just north of the center of town. Um, business C we included is, um, is uh, Redding um, Woods, uh, uh, Redding, what do we call that? It's in the southern part of the town, almost entirely built out by Redding Woods or owned by the state as part of the interchange. So we don't really expect that to um, have um, uh, mixed-use development um, right now, but wanted to add that as, a, uh, uh, as an opportunity. Um, so there you have Redding Woods. Um, so this is saying we're adding this, we're adding the regulations. We want to make sure uh, that we speci we're sp um, specific on what mixed-use is, that it's combining those two, the two uses in the same structure um, or um, on different, in different structures on the same parcel. Um, and with this, we also need to have um, uh, requirements, dimensional uh, requirements and all that for these types of, of developments. Um, uh, this is where it starts to get really detailed. Um, and um, so going through uh, fairly quickly, uh, one of the things we're looking at is having a, a zero setback. Um, that doesn't mean that the developments, uh, the, uh, the buildings have to have a zero setback, uh, but one of the things that we often uh, run into problems, especially on South Main Street, is that any of the properties there, uh, right, they all, uh, they all back up to, um, to residential um, properties. Or, uh, or residential properties on one side or the other. Um, and we wanna make sure that there's enough, enough flexibility and buildable area on the lot so, that, um, so that, that anyone that comes in and tries to redevelop those lots 
aren't right on top of the homes um, behind them. So uh, providing that added flexibility of having them, having um, uh, the redevelopment uh, uh, perhaps being up front or a portion, portion of the building up front, but just pr trying to provide some flexibility, remembering that this would go through the special permit process. So we don't need, we don't have to approve anything. It works through this whole sort of a, a negotiation um, uh, process, unlike underlying zoning, um, which is just um, laid out uh, for sort of no negotiation. Um, we were very um, uh, specific on requiring that 25% of the gross floor area of the structure um, remain commercial. Um, w that's basically the first floor of a four-story building, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we are not losing, um, we are not losing commercial um, uh, square footage. Um, And, and uh, I guess it, it, we also want to make sure that that commercial, that commercial space is front and center on the building. We don't want to have, um, you know, it, it doesn't really work too well if you have um, residential um, uh, units on the front facing Main Street and some commercial space tucked in in back. I don't think anyone would do that, but, um, you know, we see a lot of things that we wouldn't think people would, would want to do. Um, we, with this regulation, we also want to maintain um, our, um, our uh, affordable unit goal. Um, so any development that would be, anything that would be developed under this would, we would require that 10%, you can see on this slide, that 10% um, goal fitting in with much of the other um, uh, development, you know, the overlay districts that we've created um, in the past here in town. Um, parking, we're looking at um, requiring uh, 1.25 spaces per unit. Uh, that's similar to um, the downtown um, smart growth uh, uh, area. Um, and one space per 300 square feet, which is the same as, as downtown as well. Um, the, the other thing that we'd be looking for is, um, is for a developer uh, or the development to develop a a comprehensive parking plan, um, understanding that, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to build, we, we don't want any uh, building to be uh, all parking, all right? There's not much space. We don't want our, our, um, our commercial space here in town to just be a parking lot. Um, and oftentimes with mixed-use developments, uh, there's a play here that, that, uh, that someone, that the development can have where the daytime use, you, um, you know, the commercial space needs, um, needs parking during the day, not as much need for parking for the residential uses above, and, um, uh, you know, we can flip it the other way um, at nighttime. What we want to make sure is that we don't want to just have um, a, a flat set of, of um, parking spaces required, but have someone come in and explain to us how that's all going to work. Um, and um, uh, want to make sure that they have bicycle parking um, and, um, and uh, uh, the opportunity if they provide electric, ve electric vehicle charging stations, um, then maybe that we would um, be more amenable to some waivers that I'm sure that pretty much any project that comes in under this would, would have, to, have to have. Um, loading couldn't be on Main Street. That's pretty um, pretty standard. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how you'd load on Main Street. Um, we want to make sure we want to try want developers to try and limit the curb cuts on on Main Street if there's an opportunity where they can do a design where they're coming in off of a off of a side street um, or or or, um, or even better maybe a neighbor um, some way so that we we start to cut down. The number of curb cuts um, uh, on Main Street would be beneficial, um, and a process we include a process in here to to go through and have waivers. Um, it's the the layout of the parcels 
um, along in this district. They're small parcels. Um, they're they're <laughs> um, uh, very challenging to develop. Um, I don't think that we've seen any that come in uh, that don't need waivers. We just don't have that big a parcel that 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 a developer can come in and meet everything specifically. So we wanted to make sure that there was a, a waiver process. Um, that's the first motion. That's sort of the parameters of what we're looking to do. Um, and if I can, right, I can can go. What um, uh, Article 16? Um, I'm sorry. So the uh, Article 15 is all about this section, Chapter 5. Um, Article 16. We needed to make um, changes in Section 6. So we we looked at doing that in a in a different um, different article. Although all of those relate back to um, uh, back to that uh, Article 15. If Article 15, if Article 15 doesn't pass, none, <laughs> none of this matters. Okay. Um, so, uh, but I would think it was important for you to understand what these, um, what, what we're talking about here in terms of, of, um, of uh, use controls, um, so that we can have a, a good conversation about that. Hopefully, short. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, we, as I explained before about the zero foot setback, what we want to do is make sure that there's enough space on these small parcels so that, so the developers can, um, so someone can actually build something, um, uh, uh, useful and worthwhile, uh, to the town, um, uh, on here. Um, so we, rec we, we reduce the, the setbacks, um, um, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't look at making sure that there's some buffer in between, uh, or the appropriate type of buffer in between, um, in between uses. Um, uh, this is going back to the 25%, um, making sure that we have 25% um, of the gross floor area in, um, commercial, just like we said um, before, uh, landscape area. A lot of this is making sure that the language that I talked about in, um, in Chapter 5 flows into, um, flows into Chapter 6. I, I, we can go into details if, um, if need be, um, but really that's what all of this, these sections here um, taught, are, are about, making sure that the same language and same intent is in both uh, both chapters. Um, uh, this section, um, section six, there, as we were taking up section six, there were two areas where, um, where we understood that there were, pro um, I'm going to call them problems, um, so somewhat unrelated to the mixed use uh, development, but things that need to be solved in, in the zoning. Uh, the, the, um, the lot shape, um, it, you know, we defined, I think, like two years ago, we changed some of the lot, lot shape definitions. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't account for how to calculate that lot shape when the frontage is um, on a cul-de-sac bulb. So, um, so we wanted to make that change. Um, that's the lot shape change, um, uh, sort of. Um, and then the intensity regulation is making sure that um, that the dimensional controls of a lot don't create a nonconformity um, by and of itself. So something that wasn't quite clear in the existing language. And that's it. So I'll go back to this one. Um, So, um, CPDC report? Yes. Um, uh, for Article 15, um, on Monday, June 10th, 2019, CPDC convened in, uh, to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 15. All documents were made available on the town website. The public hearing was held to provide an opportunity for comment and to determine whether the provisions of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment shall be uh, adopted by the town. 
On June 10, 2019, the public hearing was open at approximately 9.15. Um, any comments received to the hearing were included as part of the record of the hearing. The public hearing was continued to Monday, July 8, 2019, and again to Monday, August 12, 2019, to allow time for further discussion and public input. The public hearing was closed on August 12, 2019, and CPDC voted 300 to recommend Article 15 to town meeting. Thank you. Do you want to do 16 now, or do you want to wait? You, you, it's up to you. Might as well do it. All right. <laughs> um, I feel like a broken record. Uh, CBDC, um, uh, on Monday, June 10th, 2019, CBDC conve convened to hold a public hearing on the proposed Article 16. All documents were made available on the town website. The public hearing was held um, to provide an opportunity for comment and determine whether the provisions of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment shall be adopted by the town. Uh, the June 10th, 2019 public hearing was opened at approximately 9.15. Comments uh, received were included in the, in the uh, record of the hearing. Public hearing was continued to May, uh, Monday, July 8th, and again to Monday, July, August 12th, to allow time for further discussion and public input. The public hearing was closed on August 12th, um, and the CPDC voted 300 to recommend Article 16 to town meeting. Okay, thank you. Again, to explain, I will allow uh, debate on both the motions under Article 15 and 16 but we really are working on 15. If you have any proposed amendments, you have to make them on 15 at that time. We will open up 16 after the fact. Uh, discussion, Mr. Arena. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Arena, Precinct One. Mr. Weston, um, two years ago, there was discussion about South Main Street potentially being a 40-hour smart growth district in an attempt to kind of balance both development, but give the town a little bit more control over facade and, and decoration elements and provide kind of the same mixed use. Um, how does this, what was the thought process around uh, this versus the 40R and, and how do those two play now in South Main Street? W we Western. did discuss um, that option. Um, that was one of the things that we, we talked about. Um, we, um, we, the conclusion was that this approach was uh, a little faster um, uh, and provided maybe not everything that we would want under a, a 40R, um, but, uh, but um, permitted us to change the existing regulations to really see what kind of um, interest there are uh, uh, in the area. In addition, we do have the, um, the South Main Street design guidelines, um, which in a 40R, we would actually incorporate those straight into the zoning because we would be allowed to by Massachusetts regulations. Um, unfortunately, in this type of zoning, we, we are not allowed to do that, but we still have those. Town staff provides those to any, anyone that comes in looking to, um, to develop, so they understand what um, CPDC in the town is looking for, um, and since this is a special permit process, um, they are, sh they should take that into account. Um, uh, so not quite as much control, um, but it, it gets us 75% of the way there, maybe 80% of the way there. Um, what does faster mean? You said it would be faster. Are we talking years, months? Help me understand. If 100% is what does faster mean? Um, the pr well, remember when we went through the 40R process, right? We have to involve um, the the state, um, and they had to go. They have to review mm -hmm. all of um, all of that. There's some other um, limitations that they have on setting the 40R district. Um, I, I'm not sure this would qualify. Yeah, yeah. So there would be a, quite a bit of work that we'd need to do with, um, with the state, um, and that takes time. So, and I mean, we could, perhaps we could do it in a year. Yeah. Okay. But. And 
given that 28 is a state highway, some of the review process you're describing here, I assume, would tie in the state for things like curb cuts or signaling or anything that the development might require. So there's a delay or a time impact there as well, yeah? Um, w any development along 28 south of the railroad tracks um, n needs to go to the state for uh, right. to review the curb uh, the curb cuts. Yes. So I assume um, you're kind of that's into depending on depending yeah. on where the existing curb cut is. Sort of that configuration. Sometimes that's fast. Sometimes there's been some cases where that's been uh, a sort of a prolonged um, uh, issue for them. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this, but have you talked to the developers community just to see how they, are they reacting positively to this? Have you gotten any kind of vibes back from them? Um, Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Arena. Um, one addition to your prior question, and then I'll answer your current yep. question. Um, when we were considering whether to extend 40R down South Main Street in this area, um, another part of the conversation was that 40R really prioritizes housing and allows mixed use, but also multifamily only sure. projects. And the CVDC at the time, and still today, feels that they want to honor um, one of our only commercial corridors in town and have more control over the com commercial component than we might be allowed through 40R. That's a great answer. Um, thank you. So to answer your current question, um, remind me what that was. <laughs> um, the, um, remind me again? Oh, yes, sorry, yes, thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank so you. the developer community, the, uh, yes. Did you chat with the developer um, community? What, were the, what was the feedback from that group? Yes, so we've actually heard um, a couple different things from developers. So we've had some positive feedback regarding the changes proposed um, because we're essentially allowing some additional options um, while well at the same time establishing parameters and trying to incentivize the things that the town wants. Um, we have had some positive feedback about these changes. We have also had some um, feedback about the current state of Main Street, <coughs> current status of Main Street, um, and that, you know, it's our current zoning regulations make including a multifamily housing component in a project very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and without a housing component, projects along South Main Street um, really aren't viable in today's um, uh, market. Um, and so the status of Main Street as well as our current zoning regulations are really um, limiting um, developer interest in South Main Street. So. Perfect. Answers both questions. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Barnes, uh, Precinct 5. Uh, I should say I, I support um, both articles. I know we're talking about Article 15. Um, and I should also say, in light of your um, opening thanks, uh, we owe a debt of thanks to you, to the CPDC, to the Community Development Department, uh, and Ms. Mercier. Um, you folks have the, uh, the, the benefit of enjoying this on a monthly basis. We only have to do it in December of each year, <laughs> in November of each year. Um, I did have, uh, yeah, <laughs> possibly. Um, Mr. Moderator, I had um, three fairly simple, very simple um, areas uh, to propose an amendment. I, I don't know how you would want me to do that. Uh, we would do that one at a time, otherwise okay. we lose track. Um, the first area will be in 5.6.8, mixed use regulations, uh, where you say um, mixed use projects along South Main Street shall be designed to comply with the South Main Street design best practices to the maximum extent practicable. What I would like to do is strike to the maximum extent practicable. So it just says shall be designed to comply with the South Main Street uh, design best practices. <coughs> okay. Is that that? Yeah. Okay. Is there a second? <coughs> second, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my, as I'm reading that, and I, I concur that uh, that the 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 business A area along South Main Street is critical to the town, but I, I also note that uh, it's also critical uh, to the residential districts that abut the length of it. Um, so it is a significant and also very sensitive area. 
I have not read the South Main Street design best practices, I apologize, but it strikes me as I was reading this that um, if there is a document referring to the design best practices, uh, that we ought to encourage um, that, that proponents uh, are suggested to adhere to that, uh, which is my, my intent in taking it out. Uh, but recognizing, um, particularly having myself served on the CPDC for 17 years, that there is always uh, the need for flexibility uh, and, and the, the need for consideration for waivers. Uh, but I, I noted I, I, I would prefer not that it not show up uh, to the developers, to the proponent's eye in that section. Um, and I note also that it is in 5.6.8.7 uh, where we say, uh, upon request from the applicant, the CPDC may consider waiving dimensional and or other requirements from sections 5.6.8 et cetera, et cetera. So I believe the, the capability for, for addressing uh, a particular need is already there, does not need to be here, and, and should not be there. Thank you. All right, we'll come back for your later ones, but Thank we you. are now discussing his proposed amendment. Is there further discussion on the proposed amendment? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries. Mr. Barnes? Uh, still Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Um, Mr. Moderator, um, thank you. A similar amendment uh, in 5.6.8.4 uh, F, uh, which talks about mixed, mixed use projects that provide for electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I, I, I understand the, the desire to encourage and incentivize um, electric vehicle charging stations. But I did note when I read this um, that to me it, it reads uh, that providing these, these uh, charging stations, et cetera, um, shall be given favorable consideration on requests for waivers, dimensional or otherwise. When I read shall be given favorable consideration, that frightens me uh, from, this, from, the, from the interpretation standpoint or the legal standpoint, it seems to suggest that, that proponents will be given favorable consideration. And I think uh, that, that it, it may be our intention to incentivize it, but I, I, don't, I don't prefer um, that it be quite that, uh, that overt, if you will, um, because it almost suggests that, that the CPDC would have to. Uh, and in these cases, we don't even need know what those requests are. So what I would suggest is it's basically language, and what I'd like to um, move to amend, it's language that you used elsewhere, and I would suggest I can, I'll just read it. Um, CPDC may waive or allow flexibility for certain dimensional or other requirements for a mixed-use project that provides, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I would put it at the, at the beginning of, of F, and I would just, you say basically the same thing in, in uh, in 5683, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, 5682. Um, I, but I would just start that, that, that provision F by saying CPDC may waive or allow flexibility for certain dimensional or other requirements for, and then just go into, into F. Uh, and then I would strike uh, where you have shall be given favorable consideration on request for waivers, dimensional or otherwise. So anything you have to drop off? I'm sorry? Where do you want to begin the uh, striking? I, I begin. We, oh, I think you, you have it, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so after the word pick up. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second to that? Second. <laughs> Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Point of information, Ms. Snyder. Can, yeah, can you use the microphone? Yeah. Gina Snyder, Precinct 5. He did mention 5.6.8.2 having the same thing. Did he mean to do them both? No? no I did not, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? None appearing. All those in, oh, excuse me, Mr. Friedman? 
Oh, okay. Will we make sure we get the language up there? Andy Friedman. Um, thank you. Speak up. Can't hear you. Andy Friedman, Precinct 4. Um, I think there's, is there one too many A's in there? No. Okay. The cap has been crossed out. Yes. Oh, so lowercase instead of the capital. Okay. Oh. Yeah. It's, it goes right to the computer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment. All right. Oh, yes, Mr. Berman. Um, Barry Berman, Precinct Four. I also want to compliment um, CPDC and the staff. Um, this didn't just show up on our warrant in November. This has been going on for like a couple of years, and a lot of thought process has gone on to it. Um, and it's really important that that South Main Street, um, this zoning um, get done in a comprehensive way because that's where you enter town from other town. And if we have um, this kind of stuff that's implemented where, de where developers have clear guidance from us, when people come into Reading, they're gonna get a sense that they're entering someplace special, right? That we've really thought about it. And so it's really important that we get this right. And so I just wanna start off by thanking you for doing that. Um, I actually like Jonathan's um, uh, amendment here um, because what it's really signaling, and, uh, and again, I haven't read the design guidelines, so some of the stuff may, that I'm gonna talk about may already be in there. Um, but I think it signals to developers is that what we think is important, especially around ride sharing and electric cars and anything to kind of mitigate traffic. Um, but one of the things that I think the develop once this is out there, the development community um, is going to look at is that we're looking at these as, all, as parcels that already exist. But I think once this is enabled, um, there's going to be um, the potential that um, parcels are going to get aggregated. So we might be looking at this one little piece of parcel, but somebody's going to think about, wow, I can do this now, and they're going to start to aggregate other, pro other, other parcels. And so one of the other benefits that I think is important, especially when we have sort of a mixed use as you're coming into town, another benefit that's important is about open space. And so um, if there's a way to kind of include in this sort of, you know, we'll look at waivers and we'll look at consideration to add the word open space, even though it may not be something that these individual parcels are gonna be able to do, it signals that if you do aggregate something that, you know, creating open space, things that um, are passive, um, that, that, um, that we're gonna look favorably upon that. I think just by adding open space to um, this amendment, I don't know, Jonathan, would you consider that friendly? Um, that would also be open to consideration for uh, waivers on things like density and, and, and other things. So something that we think it is important we should put it out there that we think it's important. And so I would include open space in that. Are you asking him to amend his amendment? Or, uh, or well is I that just a if it would he would consider it friendly, or if not, then I'll amend the amendment. You would just need the exact wording of the amendment? We'd need the exact wording, correct. Just add open space. Where do you want to add it? Uh, that provides for, for open space. more of a question whether it's, uh, well, I know it's my amendment, but I, I defer yeah. to, to CPDC. Um, well, it is a, a, a proposed amendment to the amendment, so I would allow that, but uh, it's... I'll let the smart people figure yeah. out where it should go, but I, I think the concept and the theory is, is yeah. that if we're going to be including things that um, we want to incent developers to do, open space should be one of them, whether it belongs here or someplace else. Yeah. Well, I'll defer actually, to before we accept it, we need to know exactly where it's going. Up, we can't guess at it. Mr. Miaris, did you have a comment? Or? Oh. <laughs> That's a good point. It may not be within scope. Let me think about this for a second. You know, that I, I think would have to. Where, where would it be in scope? <laughs> Can I make it, you know, G? 
No, you, no, but that wouldn't be. Uh, no, I, it, it would be without outside of scope because the town has not. It hasn't been in the warrant, so it, we can't accept that at this time. It would have to be at a, another warrant article. So we're back to the just the proposed amendment again. Is there further discussion on that? Uh, yes. Hello, uh, Megan Fiddler Carey, Precinct One. Um, I think I might be echoing what Mr. Berman just said, which is the only thing missing from this amendment is some sort of um, priority. Like I'd love to, I think originally there was a feeling that we were giving priority or applauding people for including charging stations and green op options. And I think with this amendment that that sort of concept of priority is a little bit missing. I'm not sure where to put it. I was trying to trying to play with the words, but I don't know. So could the, it be The seen? problem is it isn't really within the, uh, the scope of the article. So it's, okay. it, there really is no logical place to put it. OK. If I, if I can. Um, Mr. Weston. So uh, I, I understand what you're in commend, what you're, what you're, um, what you're uh, bringing to us. Um, going back, in, it, it, right, it doesn't quite fit into here. I think that's, right. that, that's recognizable. Um, Going back to the design, the South Main Street design guidelines, we do, in there, there is a component about open space and about the importance of open space. Um, it, it may not rise up as much as if it was in the zoning, but it, it's not silent. We're not silent about open space and the important, uh, importance of that in the design of any new development. So, so can the design guidelines be amended to basically suggest that um, this is what we basically to, com to comply with um, trying to incent yeah. that behavior? Yeah. We could certainly take a look at those and, and, and in light of, uh, if this passes, in light of these changes, make sure that the design guidelines um, yeah. incorporates, I, like I'm pretty sure it's, it's silent on uh, charging stations, so we would right. want to go in there and okay. amend that. We, we um, yeah, would look at, um, we would look at open space and, okay. and other things like that. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, well, just actually, just Ms. K Ms. Fiddler Carey still has the floor, so <laughs> we'll go back to you. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. So, I, yeah, I guess I was talking more about the, um, the, the, the green technology than the space part, the, the parking, the electric cars, that such. But I just wanted to put the word priority in there somewhere, so it's maybe CPDC may give priority to waivers and allow flexibility for certain dimensional, I don't know. That would have to be with the amendment. That's just my thought. I just, I just wanted to include the spirit of um, giving priority. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binder. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? No, no, just the, um, the um, uh, proposed amendment as proposed by Mr. Barnes. So, so the, the open space component of that was n is not, is Correct. not part right. of the amendment. All right. I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was still up there. Thank you. Okay, further discussion on the proposed amendment? appearing. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Uh, Mr. Barnes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I have the, the exact same um, amendment for another section, 5686. Six, okay. Curb cuts and driveways, and it's B. It would be the exact same language and strike through and you Yeah, not right there. And then period after uh, parcels, and then strike through after it. Yeah, same principle, Mr. Moderator. Okay, is there a second? Second. Further discussion on that proposed amendment? None appearing. All those in favor, please rise, raise your hand. 
Those opposed? And the motion carries. We are back to the main motion as amended. Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I would like to make um, a proposed, I would like to make a motion to amend uh, under mixed use regulations 5.6.8.1A. A mixed use project proposed on a corner lot may have a zero foot setback from both streets. I would like to change that to read a mixed use project proposed on a corner lot will have a minimum of a five foot setback on both streets. So you're changing the zero to a five, is that? Well, I'm changing may have to will have a minimum of a five foot setback. Oh, I see. Or shall. I see. Shall, shall have. Okay. Okay. So shall. And shall then have a minimum. Of five. Have a minimum of five. Okay. Make sure we get that. That's it. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second, Ms. O'Neill. Um, I don't feel that the argument in support of this on the part of the CPDC is strong enough to warrant the what will happen when this actually comes into play. We're zoning for years going forward, and it's, we can see from the development going in at 475 Main Street on the former Sunoco station, zero foot setback is pretty, um, it's pretty severe. It doesn't allow for any buffer, any greenery, any sense of, you know, room. And if you have a corner lot, and there are many intersections along South Main Street, Pineville, Percy, uh, Avon, Cross, Knollwood, Summer, and more, um, and you could have both sides on both corners um, going forward, that, um, I don't know, it's pretty extreme. You also, not in addition to not allowing for any uh, natural looking buffer, um, you're um, damaging any sight lines for people coming down from any of those streets onto Main Street. I ask you to take a look and you can ma imagine the intersection of uh, Main Street and Knollwood Road. So that now has the Carter Coleman building on one corner and the Santander Bank on the other corner. So I agree with not having major parking lots out in the front, but both of those look pretty nice. And if you can imagine those moved forward with no setback, what that would do to that area, to Knollwood Road and other people from Southern Avenue coming down Knollwood to get onto Maine, um, and imagine that at over time at all the intersections, um, I think it's a pretty serious uh, consequence. So um, I ask for you to support this uh, proposed change. Thank you. Okay, we are now discussing this proposed amendment. Is there further discussion? Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Maughan, Precinct 4. A, a question first. This setback, is, is it from the curb, the sidewalk, or the town property line? It's from the town property line. And if I remember from previous uh, information it, it, when we talked about the bylaws, that town right-of-way varies significantly throughout town. So on Main Street itself, um, that the right-of-way, the Route 28 Main Street right-of-way, is generally about a foot or so back from the existing sidewalk. But, um, but on m most town roads, um, so most of, in this case, most of the side streets, the right-of-way is significantly beyond the edge of either the curb or the, the sidewalk. Um, we generally don't build up to the edge of the right-of-way like the state has. So with the, uh, as originally written, that zero setback, that means the, the facade of a building could be one foot or less from the sidewalk. Yes. Could be. Could a portion be. of the building could be. I, d I don't think that, well, a couple of things. One is that uh, on the on, uh, you know, uh, I don't see in the, the case that was brought up, you know, safety is always ver the very first thing we look at. We, you know, CBDC, the um, uh, town engineer, the police, no one would allow buildings to be set up so close to the street 
100% so that you, you don't have sight lines. That's one of the things that we always are looking at is, um, is traffic sight lines. Um, but what we do want to do is, yeah, perhaps part of the building is set r right up to the, right up to the, um, to the um, sidewalk, part of it, maybe and not all of it, but if we have some setback, that means everything needs to be set back from, um, from, the side, from, the set, from the sidewalk or the side street. So with the zero setback, could there be a balcony or something on the upper floors that could extend over the sidewalk? Not over the sidewalk, no. Well, to, to point out uh, from past experience, with the zero setback, that's no flexibility. And if somebody makes a mistake, we end up building in town property. We've all seen that. Yep, we have. A and I think to, to add a few more feet as far as flexibility, so if that happens again, we're not in the town sidewalk. So, so I support uh, something other than a zero setback. I think we're setting us up for, for a problem. Further discussion on the, uh, Ms. Binda? Ms. Binda. Um, Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, thank you for the um, presentation you gave. I generally agree with what you're doing. A lot of work has gone into this, and I, and I support um, most of it. I'm going to support the amendment. Um, I have a couple questions. The Carter Coleman building on Knollwood and Main Street, do you know what the setback is on that? Do you, do you have any idea what the setback is? Not off the top of my head, no. I could look into it okay. on Monday back in the office. <laughs> Pardon me? I can look into it on Monday back in the office for you. Okay, it's at least five feet, right? I mean, it's, it's five, 10 feet. It's, so I, as part of the, I was the historical commission representative to the um, South Main Street design guidelines many years ago. I don't know if they've been replaced, but I, we worked on this. And, and that building was sort of given as an example of what Reading wanted South Main Street to look like. And, and a couple of the things were buildings closer up, parking to the back, and, and buffer zone. And that's a, that's a really nice looking building and they have nice landscaping, it's well maintained. And I think that that really, you know, that uh, I kind of think that's what I would like development on South Main Street to look like. So I really don't wanna see there be no setback at all. The other difference between this building, um, this um, commercial district and the other, the downtown area, is that, you know, while there are, resi it is residential somewhat, but it's, it's not a walking, it's not so much a walking commercial district. So I think that the not different, yet. or do you want to? Not it? yet. Not yet, but you, okay. But there really is a difference between, I mean, there. Remember, as planners, we think, you know, 20 years out, so I'm sorry okay. to <laughs> Okay, but, but I think that visually, and also, you know, the way people travel in there, um, having, having buildings that close to the side, you know, the sidewalk, it is a different, it is a different space. And when you do enter that, if you, you know, having some green space, I, I agree with Mr. Berman that, you know, open space, green space is important. And I think that one way that you maintain that, even if it's not a big open space, just seeing the beautiful grass and the plantings around buildings um, makes a difference. It really does make a difference visually. So I, I understand there's a need for flexibility, but <coughs> I'm gonna support the five feet. I would even wanna see you know, what, what that building is, the Carter Coleman building on Main and Knollwood, and say, <coughs> I would even say 10 feet. Um, but at least five feet, thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Mowry. Jonathan Barnes, Precinct 5. Can I just ask, I, kn I think you mentioned it at the outset, Mr. Weston, uh, what the um, commission's 
philosophy or rationale was, but what is the what was the rationale? What is the rationale for the suggestion that uh, that structure these projects on corner lots be uh, zero? So it's it's really all it was all about uh, flexibility and giving um, giving developers um, uh, letting them be creative. Uh, right. This is a this is a special permit. Remember, so uh, it, so we w typically work collaboratively with the developer to achieve the the you know what what works. Um, uh, generally, I you know I would agree that um, that you know a, a building across the entire front, zero setback, doesn't work. That's not what we want. That's but. There may be some configuration of some building where, you know what, the best thing to do is have a, a portico or something, some structure so that it's, so that it's at a front, uh, you know, it, it juts out to a zero step back with part of it. And that allows that developer to pull the other part of their building back 10, 15 feet, get the same square footage and, ha and have part of the parcel be green and open space. Uh, or landscaped, not open space, but, but landscaped. So that's really the idea, is to provide enough flexibility, understanding that this is a special permit process, that we could work with the developer um, and, and see what, what kind of things they, they come up with and, and, and give them as much, work, as much um, property, as much of the parcel they could have to work with. Um, while we still wanted to maintain what we, what we wouldn't ever um, uh, be flexible on is encroaching, sort of overlooking and, and encroaching into the neighbors, um, especially in the, the Rio on this. In this okay, corridor. thank you. And, so and, and in that, that that's regard, that's the thinking. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, how, how does the, the aspect of being a corner lot distinguish this, this philosophy from any other lot? That's uh, not a corner lot. Um, it, it's, it's sort of the, I guess it's the, it's the same, it's the same thing. Really, uh, and on the corner lots, understanding that the, the lot line is not the back of sidewalk um, like it is in, in other, uh, along Main Street. Thank you. So. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes. Cynthia Cool, Precinct uh, 6. Did somebody mention the building across from Dunkin' Donuts, that, that new building that went up? Um, I think it's next to the Snow Co. Is that a corner lot? Because that one's like right up to the street, and it's like two, maybe three stories high, and that really would have benefited if it had some uh, greenery or something in the front. It's just really um, right on the street, and it's, it's, not, it's not very, um, it doesn't look good. It doesn't go with the rest of the flow of of downtown. So what happened there, I think the five foot um, setback might have helped in this case because you could have put some trees or something there. The, there um, will be some trees going in on that. Um, there will be trees going yeah, in? Yeah. Because street, there's something, street trees. Yeah, it still seems, what is the setback? Can you tell me on that building? Zero. Z oh, zero? And you're going to put trees in? On the sidewalk. Oh, in the sidewalk. Yeah. Oh, but just it's like, still just like further up on Main Street. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know if it's the height of the building that is the worst, or that, or, or that it's up against the sidewalk. But um, something or both of those should be considered um, when you build on a corner lot, or at least in that area. Um, there's something about it that's not right. Anyway, so I'm in agreement with at least five feet foot um, setback here. Ms. Toomey? Nancy Toomey, Precinct 3. Um, I, it's almost too bad you don't have pictures of towns that have zero setback. I mean, one that comes to mind that I absolutely love is Melrose, and it's downtown where all the buildings are such or even our downtown, where you walk and the building is right there. I would point out that if you're trying to get green space in front of buildings, they don't always get maintained, and we don't have recourse to have them maintained. So those nice green spaces you're talking about turn out to weeds, and we're talking about the Knollwood building. I'd say if you turn the corner on Knollwood, 
I really don't like what that looks like on the side. It's got the dumpster, it's got weeds, it's got piles of dirt, and I don't think the town has any recourse to have them remove that. So I do not support this amendment. I think that it opens up uh, tremendous issues for how the building gets maintained and how it looks. Um, I think the intent here is as you come into Reading, you come into a town. Right now we come into parking lots and it looks really not like a town at this point in time. So I don't support the five foot setback. I like the zero foot setback. It gives you flexibility. Further discussion? On? Yes. Mr. Panella. Steve Herrick, uh, oh, Precinct 8. Uh, my first uh, question is just, uh, I'm going to put my ignorance of uh, this whole topic on display. Uh, my read from this is that everything in this zone is a commercial zone, and if you want to go mixed use, it has to be at least 25% commercial, and Effectively, what that means is there will be no, unless there's some extraordinary exception I'm not aware of, there's, there will be no 100% residential units or w residential buildings built in this section. Is, am I reading that correctly? Is that? The, there are, um, we uh, officially allow it in our, um, our table of uses. Um, the feedback that we've gotten, even as we try and work that through, um, it is very difficult to try and build a, a um, multi-family um, uh, unit on any property using those regulations. So I but, can't say no, it won't so, happen. But, but, but I, would, I would suggest that what we're doing here makes it more difficult because we are defining uh, in this commercial district that it's either commercial or it's multi-use, and if it's multi-use, it has to be at least partly commercial. So that to me says there's no, no commercial. So it has to have some res. It can't have. It can't be all residential. That's what I'm taking away. I, and I'm not saying that there there isn't some method for getting around that rule, but we're making it more difficult than. We're, we're putting up another barrier. I'm, not, I'm just trying to understand what the implication of this is. So you asked a lot of questions in one question. Um, Sorry. Uh, thank you for the question. So um, I think that we're mixing two different things. So under the regulations that we're proposing tonight, mixed use, we do always require a 25% commercial, 25% com of the gross floor area be commercial, right? So a project that's redeveloped um, using the mixed use provisions will have a commercial component. It is still possible that in our current zoning, someone could do a multifamily project because we allow it currently. It's just very difficult to implement because we have some like provisions that make it feasible, like infeasible. Um, for example, requiring a minimum lot area of 40,000 square feet for a multifamily project um, when the average lot size along Main, South Main Street is 27,000 square feet. So right off the bat, you need to be able to accumulate multiple parcels. Um, and there are many other hurdles. So multifamily currently is not an easy thing to do. We are not proposing to change those regulations because like I mentioned earlier, the CPDC feels that honoring the commercial corridor and having a commercial component to these projects is very important. So we're not trying to make solely multifamily projects any easier, we're leaving that alone, but we're establishing a process for mixed use that has a commercial component and makes the the multi-family housing component more vi more viable and more possible. Okay. okay. I Got have it. another question or observation that's on a totally different topic. If you'll indulge me for one moment. Yeah, we're still we're actually on the uh, proposed amendment right now. We're, we're still it, discussing. Are we on the are we on the May shell? No, we are on the the proposed amendment for the uh, the five foot set. Yes, yeah. and that's what I'm getting. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, and I apologize for that digression. Uh, when we say, it said before, we may have a setback of zero feet, now we're changing that to we shall have a setback of five feet. The may, who controlled the may before? You talked about a special permit that's associated with these, and you suggested that there was flexibility on the part of CPDC or the zoning board 
in terms of how that was administered. So when we say shall, have we taken that flexibility away from the zoning board of the CPDC and said that no matter what you do in terms of couplers or variances, you can't have something that sticks out closer and we've, we've, we've drawn a line in the sidewalk or whatever? So the, the, the control in this is with CPDC, first of all, um, uh, in terms of granting the special permit. Um, and the way that it was written before may have a 0% setback. That implies that, right, they can't have l less than a 0%, uh, a zero, uh, zero foot setback, not percent, I'm sorry. Zero. They can't have less than a zero foot setback. Um, uh, I think that's implied. Um, uh, but they could have something more than that. So that may is appropriate. Um, in the amendment, they're saying, um, uh, the amendment is they shall have a minimum of five feet. So that means that, right, they can't have a one foot, two foot, three foot setback. They have to have five, but they still could, someone could still come in with a 15 foot setback. Well, That's all fine. It, CPDC in either of those cases would work with the, with the um, developer to, to establish the, to, to work through the site plan. Is, is have we taken away the, by the word shall, have we taken away the flexibility of CPDC or the zoning board to allow something sh uh, less than that? Would we have to come back to, to yeah. town meeting in order to we, yes, provide that kind yes, of flexibility? Yes, yeah, you've taken away five feet of flexibility of, of allowing development in that five feet. Okay. Is that important or not? I, that's up to, to you all. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, please. Yeah. Vanessa Alvarado, Precinct 5. Um, I have a question regarding the, uh, the pre what the previous speaker just said. Can you confirm that if we have it as currently written, minimum of five feet setback, that the developer could apply for a variance from the CPDC or ZBA. So it's therefore, this is the standard, however they could ask for a variation. That's question one. So, uh, <coughs> because we await, allow waivers through this process, yes, um, someone could come in um, with a zero, zero uh, foot setback um, and ask for a waiver from the five foot setback and they would need to prove to CPDC and you know everyone that attends the meeting and everything uh, that that's um, that's warranted so um, so it's a, it's a bigger hurdle if that's if this is passed um, but it's not impossible for someone to come in um, and explain uh, you know sort of rationalize that a, that a zero foot setback is appropriate and get granted a waiver Thank you. Um, so therefore, we are not limiting the flexibility. We're just making it a little bit more challenging to decrease that setback. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I support this amendment. Um, you know, the select board recently had a presentation from a developer that we are trying to encourage development of this area, um, and part of that will be including, or the part of that would be to encourage pedestrian traffic. Right now, that particular road is very high traffic. If we have a zero setback for the majority of the length of that road, it's going to be very uncomfortable to have pedestrian traffic however many years down the line because you're going to have a building, a sidewalk, and then a high-speed road. Um, so I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion, Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. I also support the amendment. Uh, I take exception to the comparison with Melrose. Melrose doesn't have a gas station, a Sullivan tire, which is, you know, just, just moving in. It doesn't have a highway going down the middle. It's more like Haven Street, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's comfortable and it's nice and it's pedestrian friendly. It's going to be very difficult, even in 20 years, with the highway there and the, and the width of that highway, unless there's a, multiple traffic signals 
you know, which the state may not allow on the highway, to make it that kind of a thing. I certainly support development. So, I mean, I'm very, you know, for, for most of what's being proposed, uh, I'm happy with that, you know, direction, because this town desperately needs that. But j when we talked about appearance and, ca and character, when we were talking about, you know, residential areas, I think appearance also makes a difference in the commercial area, if you, especially if you want to encourage traffic. And if you're talking about foot traffic, bicycle traffic, also bicycle traffic, you know, it's going to be difficult if you also have zero setback when they, you know, leave the street and get on. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Yes. Snyder. Tina Snyder, Precinct 5. I support this amendment if you ever hoped to get it to be more walkable along Main Street, and especially if you're talking mixed use where you're trying to encourage them to build housing on top of commercial and you want people to be able to walk, you're going to need that setback. Uh, I don't know how many of you walk on, have walked on Main Street. I mean, the traffic is going really fast, and there's four lanes of it, and you, you can't even cross Main Street. So to have a minimum five feet, that, that's a bare minimum for setback at the corners. I absolutely support this amendment and hope other people will too. Part of the discussion? Yes. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Can you come down to the microphone? Uh, I asked that the clerk zoom so that the text is larger. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, in the back, on, in the middle, in the middle, yeah, you. Uh, Jennifer Cromit Pula, Precinct 3. So I actually live in the South Main Street area, on South Main Street, and traffic's very fast. I walk to Bagel World, I walk to uh, Main Street proper, and I definitely am in agreement of this amendment. It's a very fast road. We need a buffer that we don't have right now. Thank you. And there was a hand on the other side of the aisle. Yes. Dave Cowell, Precinct 5. Also support the amendment, and it's great to meet somebody who walks to Bagel World. Uh, <laughs> more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we should we get more people walking and biking to it. We're going to solve some of the traffic problems. but. Um, anyway, I thank uh, Mary Ellen for making the amendment. I think it was a great idea. Uh, you made the comment, John, that you don't want to have uh, zero setback all along the length of a building, but when you, when you let people do that, it's what they can do and it's what they have done in a couple places. Thank you. Mr. Wells? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Uh, ooh, sorry. Um, if there's this five-foot setback, does that mean the sidewalks are going to move further away from the street, or are the sidewalks going to stay where they currently are? So you're still going to have pedestrians on top of the street, whether the building's there or it's five feet back, correct? The, yeah, so um, the, <laughs> the development of the right-of-way in this stretch is primarily up to Mass DOT. Um, and the development of those sidewalks are uh, under their jurisdiction. Um, in, in, I'm going to say generally that's the way that's the way it's going to be. We, I know town is pushing to, always pushing to get bigger, um, wider sidewalks. Um, but yeah, those sidewalks aren't necessarily tied to um, to the development outside of that. So we section. all saw how long it took them to actually repave South Main Street. Do we really expect them to accommodate us and move the sidewalks or give more pedestrian space? The, the, the setback doesn't really have, is, it's not going to impact pedestrian safety if that's what people are concerned about. Um, I can kind of speak to that if that's okay. Please, um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weld, for your comment. Um, so one thing that, that could be negotiated during the process um, if there is a five-foot setback is you know not just landscaping out front there, but additional hardscape 
to widen the space that pedestrians have to walk in that area um, and to remove them a little further from that busy roadway. That's not out of the realm of possibility. Okay. And that would be something the developer would have to agree to on their own site. Terry? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I, I'm not, I want to see more um, setbacks on South Main. I'd love to see it more walkable. I, I just wanted to share an anecdote that if you're in that lovely Carter Coleman working on a Saturday in the winter, like when it gets dark and you walk out of your office and leave your phone and your keys and everything in your office and you can't get back in and then it snowed and you try to go out to the street and you figure, well, I'm gonna have to hoof it uptown and no one's cleared any of the snow banks and it's dark you're stuck there and you're gonna do all kinds of creative things to call for help and, and uh, so anyway, I guess I would assume that as uh, things get developed, we're gonna have to enforce snow removal. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Arena? Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. Ms. Mercier, the, um, I may have missed it, but this only addresses the corner lots, not any other lot but a corner, correct? That's correct. I was waiting for someone to notice that. <laughs> thank you. It, where are the, uh, jumping ahead to I'm sure, it's gonna, where are the other lots addressed? So in Section 6, the intensity regulations. Oh, great. We we'll have wait for that in a moment. So right. that, and there is another section as well that would need to be changed. Right. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Bonazzoli. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James Bonazzoli, Precinct 6. Um, I too commend you guys for, for all your work. Um, I'm very s supportive of this amendment. You know, walking is one thing, but I think the um, property on Main Street that somebody brought up, to me is a good example. Um, we talk about the McMansions and how these McMansions are ruining the look of our residential areas because they're too big. Well, frankly, I think these large buildings that are going up are ruining how our downtown looked and feels, felt. And so if I have to kind of force CPDC to make it smaller by this regulation, then that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. We are back to the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Yes, you. Uh, actually, the one right, the, the closer one. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jeffrey Corum, Precinct 7. I have two points. Um, in Section 5.6.8.7 waivers, Part B says the provisions of Section 5.6.8.2 and 5.6.8.3 shall not be waived. But if I look back at 5.6.8.2, the paragraph underneath A says uh, something about waivers. So it seems like one section says there are no waivers, but then a section says there are waivers. Yeah, um, so thank you for that. Um, the section that, se section 5687, was it at the end there, where we say um, there shall be no waivers from sections 5682, which is the commercial component, and also from section 5683, which is the affordable housing component. Um, and then, as you pointed out, in 5682, um, the second paragraph, which actually should be a B, and I have a friendly amendment proposed for that um, later. Um, that's referring to if certain things happen within that commercial component, waivers can be granted from other sections. So I do not believe they're in conflict. All right. Um, and then in section 5684F, where it says IE zip car, I believe the abbreviation you want there is EG zip car, unless you're trying to restrict it only to zip car. EG would give poor example. Thank you. Thank you. 
Is there any uh, objection to that being part of the main motion? None appearing. Further discussion on the uh, main motion? Ms. Binda? Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I had a question about the language 5682, the very bottom, shall be given favorable consideration on requests for waivers, dimensions, and otherwise. This was asked um, in the other sections by Mr. Barnes. Mm -hmm. So can we apply the Barnes language to um, this also? Because I, I don't, I, I, for the same reason, it seems like I was wondering whether shall be means automatically, and if you allow for an existing tenant, then you shall be given favorable consideration on dimensional waivers. Formatting may not be great, but I think that gets the point, right? <laughs> no? No. We need the exact, uh, the exact are you proposing an amendment? Yes, I'm proposing okay. this, yes. Right, we need to get it exact before okay. we discuss it. I think is that's that right. Is, is, is that, that it? you just got the yeah. extra space in there, but you've okay. got you got the wording in. Okay, is that the way you you, you see it? I yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Is, is there a second on that? Second. Further discussion on the proposed amendment. None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Now I saw a couple of hands up in the back earlier. Um, over here to start with. Good evening, my name is Danica Medeiros, Precinct 3. Um, I'm referring to 5.6.8.4, parking. So I live on um, a street that's off of Main Street. Um, and a nearby commercial building has used our street for the past couple of years for their employees um, who have parked outside my driveway where I back up every day. Um, and create litter and all sorts of kind of hazards for people that are trying to get around. So the reason um, I'm looking at number, uh, sorry, letter D, to see how we can add in language, I'm proposing an amendment, to add in language that would sh um, require them to provide in their planning how the project plans to compensate or mitigate overflow parking of commercial space um, and residential space for their employees and their customers. I think this may be out of scope. Let me take a look at it for a second. <laughs> um, sufficient is kind of the word. So what is it exactly you're proposing? I'm proposing that D says um, at the very end, instead of managed period, it says, and um, how the project plans to mitigate overflow parking of employees and customers. What I worry about is they will have, like maybe the commercial space is, is going to have dozens of employees, which they have not planned for and don't provide parking for, who are then walking up and down Main Street and parking on side streets, blocking people's driveways. Thank you. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I, it is. It is yeah. within. Scope. I mean, I, that's, I that's essentially the intent. Yes. I mean, part yeah. of the intent yeah. of why we 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 have that we included that parking plan was to deal with 
situations like, like yours. Um, uh, visitor parking is something we always, um, we always um, struggle over, which I think is sort of that same, some of those same issues. Loading, whether it's regular loading or uh, I'm going to call special event loading, which, you know, people moving in and out of units. Um, so, yeah, we, we want them to deal with all of that, but it's spelling that out explicitly seems to make sense. Uh, first of all, is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second. Mr. Miaris? If you don't mind, I'd like to uh, suggest a cleaner version of this. <laughs> so instead of fewer words and um, it doesn't suggest that the project somehow has a, a plan. Is that okay with the mover of the proposed amendment? Yes. Is there any objection? None appearing. Okay. Although, um, excuse me, uh, discussion on the proposed amendment, Mr. Arena? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Arena, Precinct 1. This may be out of order, but does this comprehend the town's involvement in creating such parking spots separate from the um, developer of the parcel? This is purely the developer. The purely the developer. They need to come to us to say how they're going to manage their cars that they generate. Uh, thinking of downtown and the CVS, the, the parking lot, and does any of this document deal with the town's involvement in thinking ahead about centralized parking? In your wildest imagination, if this takes off and you end up with another downtown, downtown, um, have you thought ahead in the way the town would provision for parking independent of how projects and developers did? Is that comprehended anywhere in this document? Um, thank you for your comment, Mr. Arena. We dream of all sorts of ways to <laughs> mitigate parking all over town all the time. Um, this document does not contemplate any of them at this time, um, but as you know, we amend zoning quite often, so right, should that you. need arise, we can come back. Thank you. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? Yes, Mr. Wise. Tom Wise, Precinct 3. Um, maybe it's just me, um, and I'm sure there's people that are better at English than I am and grammar, but I think there's too many ands in there. Detailing how both would work together, comma, be managed, comma, and. So I'm, I'm wondering if we should have a friendly, if there would be a friendly amendment, Ms. Medeiros, to take out that and and put a comma in place of it after work together. The very right before be managed. So the very first one in blue. Or if that's. My intent was that they're managed together as a system. So, th so that's why it's worded that way. What are you, what are you thought? What's the consensus? Well, I'm going to count myself as a consensus of one, and uh, I, I think it's fine the way it is. Okay. Further discussion on the proposed amendment? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries, and we are back to the uh, main amendment, main uh, motion as amended. Mr. Talbot? Just a brief and friendly amendment that the shared parking and we talked about this earlier today, um, where shared parking would be allowed and excluding on residential parcels. That was higher up. Yeah, B, 
six, yeah, the mixed use project with permanent shared parking arrangement with any non-residential abutting property. Mm -hmm. Last line of that paragraph. I believe that is the intent. Non-residentially zoned, maybe this is, thank you. So is that, the, is that the proposed amendment? Okay. Second. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Any discussion on that proposed amendment? And there's some, no? All right, are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Back to the main amendment, main uh, motion as amended. Mr. Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Sylvester, uh, Precinct 3. Uh, I'd like to continue on with the recommendation of Mr. Berman. Um, it seemed that at the time earlier, we were dealing with the section on parking, and we wanted to put open space in there. Um, to me, uh, the open space can be added um, at the uh, end where it talks about waivers. You just add another condition um, under the section on waivers. I, I would still call that outside of the scope. You're adding an extra condition that the town was not warned about. It's not just a matter of wording changes. So that would be outside okay. of the scope. I, I, I also have a, a question. And it's, it's about some of this parking. Um, how do we enforce it? Nancy Toomey mentioned the uh, wonderful appearance of the side of that building at Knollwood in summer. And I go by it all the time. And uh, in, in addition to the pile of dirt, which is now grassed over, and the dumpster, uh, there's for all intents and purposes, an abandoned car that has been there long enough to be on Google Maps. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't have, uh, there's, there's no front license plate, and I don't think there are uh, any places uh, in Massachusetts now running just single plate cars. Um, so if we can't get them to you know, obey regulations, what teeth do we have? in the other ones, and I'm just curious. Um, Interesting question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's a great question, and um, so any you know project that comes through a process with the town, so it's such as the special permit process, which we're proposing for the mixed-use projects, um, or a site plan process, or um, a variance process, or something like that, typically ends up with a decision that has conditions in it. And those conditions give the town zoning enforcement capability. Um, and so we tend to be very careful when we write those decisions that we include conditions that are strong and have teeth and mitigate situations such as the one you're talking about. Further discussion and then, on the... And then, it's in, and then it's up to enforcement. So letting the town know and having the ability to go and make those enforcement actions. I saw a hand in the very back there. Hi, Marianne Downing, Precinct 3. Just so I'm clear, I can comment on the main. That's what we have. Yeah, right. We're back to the main. So I'm, I'm, I have a question, and I'm not sure if I have an amendment. It will depend on the answer. Under 5683B1, the percentage of affordable units um, I'm very troubled that it's only 10% when throughout our 40R districts um, and 40B districts, we're typically requiring 25% um, in apartment complexes and 20% in condo complexes. And with 25%, um, I don't know if, if, if the 40B kind of regulation applies where they all count towards affordable. But I, I want to understand the rationale for why this is so low, because to me, this is a big Christmas gift we're giving to developers. We are having, having no shortage of developments in town. Um, there's like five of them downtown in the 40R zone that are, all have developers lining up to, to um, provide 25% affordable in 
other than the metropolitan mixed use developments. And I get concerned that this is going to now, if you picture we were, someone earlier was referencing the Sunoco development, you know, we have worries that South Main Street could be lined with that, where you have, you're adding now lots and lots of units to our total threshold that now the rest of town has to, um, you know, add in more, you're, you're subject to more 40B because now we have the, the higher number that we have to have 10% townwide. So can you explain to me why this is only 10% and not 25%? Um, yes. Ms. Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mrs. Downing. Um, so that's a great question. And um, while it does seem like developers are lining up to develop projects under 40R, actually affordable housing is one of the areas that's, that's really hard for them to manage within their development um, pro formas. Or at least that's what we hear. Um, mm -hmm. they, they have managed it and we have projects being built so it has worked out. Um, but it isn't such a home run. Um, the reason that we propose 10% for our first technically inclusionary zoning within our zoning bylaw um, is because it keeps us on pace with the state requirements. Um, and it's, it's, it's a simple concept to wrap your head around, um, especially given that our threshold is 10 units. So um, I put it in this way to start the conversation about what we might actually wanna do with inclusionary zoning down the road, um, to, but to get something on the books that I thought was um, easy math and in line with state requirements and keep us on pace with our subsidized housing inventory. Um, can you can you explain further what you mean by in line with state requirements? Um, well, so the general state requirement is that 10% of our housing stock be affordable. That's town-wide though. That's town, yes, that's town But wide. we're, you know, so when, the, when the census mm -hmm. comes, we're gonna fall way behind after Redding Woods gets added in, right? Um, I think there's, Still a little bit of an open question on that um, because we have done a lot of work in recent years to build housing and build affordable housing. Um. So, it, but if you pass it this way and developers start jumping at this opportunity and you have people mm -hmm. putting in like 30 units and only mm -hmm. three are affordable, we won't really have the leeway to change this if we see that this is a, a big hit, will we? We will at town meeting be able to change it if we start to see that it's it's too easy to accomplish. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, uh, amendment to correct, I think, just a clerical oversight. That same section, 5683B1, I point out the words affordable to households earning. And then, so the words affordable to households earning, they're right there and then go down to number three. I think in number three, I think after 10% of units, you wanna add the same four words, affordable to households earning. So put the cursor after 10%, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then um, the next line, after 15% of units, add the same four words. And I hope that's a friendly amendment. Well, we will uh, open it to the floor in case there's any objection. Is there a second to that? Second, discussion on that proposed amendment. Men appearing, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Back to the main motion again, as amended. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Zasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, just a quick question on the parking. Um, so I know in the uh, 40R district in downtown, we have a 1.25 per unit requirement. Um, I was just checking real quick, so the, uh, and I know, I don't think anybody's taking advantage of it, but we have the Gateway Smart Growth District that's in the bylaw right now as well. Um, and that's a 1.6 per unit. Now I know the 1.25 downtown was really driven by a lot of different factors, including the fact that these units were gonna be near the downtown, near the depot, transportation. This is you know, primarily business, business um, A, where you're not necessarily, I mean, you could be as far out as you know, 128 per se. Um, is that still a viable rationale? Um, I mean, what was your thought process? Because again, 
and this, uh, there is some discrepancy. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll let Julie talk on the 1.6, although that was, <laughs> she may not be able to, that's before her time. Um, um, you know, and I, I, I always um, talk to Julie about this, but, you know, Reading's a pretty small town, geographic area, and especially when we're talking about the commercial district, it's really small um, geographically. Um, and because we focus so much on all of however many parcels there are, we start to think that, um, that um, you know, um, Bagel World is way down on South Main Street. Um, and, and so far, away. it's not. These are all walking distance and, and, um, and close to, and the reason why I'm saying this is, is relatively close to the train station. Maybe not by the time you get to, down to, to like Calarisos, but a lot of the more developable parcels are, are closer up to, uh, to the train station and, and ultimately walkable. Um, uh, so I, I think the one point, really the 1.25 got established with that in mind. Uh, and also with the, the uh, when I'm coming back to the comprehensive parking plan, really uh, understanding, you know, no, they're not going to be able to park out on the street, uh, the overflow parking, really coming up, having them come up with a plan on how are you going to restrict, you know, um, uh, um, what kind of programs are you going to put in place to make sure that you only have so many parking spaces per unit, you have visitor parking, you have all those sorts of things, um, which we really weren't able to do or didn't do in, um, in the um, overlay district. I, I think the 1.6, right, that was, that was back, honestly, right, that was in your time um, when that was approved, um, when you were on CPDT, and I think that was really, right, that was um, uh, uh, with a little bit of different thinking. It was. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and and so we haven't gone back to, to that. Um, you, to you also have the ability here, to, to, to your credit, with the, this is a special permit. So yes. you do have that, and you've got a comprehensive plan. I mean, the other thing I was thinking as I was reading this was that you know, you're also going to have to consider the unit sizes. I mean, you don't necessarily know, are these one bedrooms, are these two, are these three bedroom right. luxury condos, what are right. they putting in place? Right, so certainly, yes, to your point, certainly if we see three bedroom um, units and they think that they're gonna, they say, yeah, we'll 1.25 per space. N no, that's not gonna work. We know that. N they know that. Um, and so we'll be more stringent on that. And because of the special permit, we can, yep. we can focus in on that. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the main motion? We have a move to adjourn. We have not finished this article yet, but town meeting can do what it wants. Uh, we have a motion to uh, adjourn. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion does not carry. We continue on with the main motion under Article 15. Further discussion? Yes. Cynthia Cole, Precinct 6, on um, 5.681B. We'd like the setback on uh, Main Street where that street is so busy. Does this only apply to Main Street? I would like that at five feet. Um, thank you. The proposed changes here um, are for all of Business A as well as Business C, as shown on the maps earlier in the presentation. So right. um, most of Business A is on Main Street, but there are a couple sections that are not, that are small. Um, and then Business C, as you know, is a in the southern portion of town. Yeah. We we did change the A portion already. We put a f an amendment in there for five feet. But um, B is also, like the one, you know, the building next to the corner lot should also be set back at five feet, especially on Main Street because it's, it's very mm -hmm. busy. Yeah, so I think what this is getting at is actually that the property that's being redeveloped if it has a shared parking arrangement with its next door non-residential neighbor, the property that's being redeveloped is allowed to, the building on that property is allowed to be as close as five feet 
as close, sorry, as close zero. to zero feet yeah, but to that side property. Right. This is more complicated than it looks. Because what we want is Main Street yesterday. It's so busy that um, the building should be set back. We think it should be set back five feet. So, so I don't know how you can. So that I think has already been kind of discussed and agreed to that the building would right, be five feet from Main Street. What this is talking yeah. about is that side property line that's shared with the abutting property where the shared parking arrangement is. Right. Okay. And we also need to, in um, uh, in in sixteen in the next um, in the next article, Two. we need to go in and, and make an amendment to to the floor here uh, okay. to change some of the parameters to five feet. Um, right. To, to match okay, up so with what this one in particular, <laughs> see, it's, it's a little complicated. This one in particular will not necessarily need to be changed, you're saying? It's okay. talking about the side property, the building's proximity to its side neighbor, its side property. Oh, line, not the front, not, not the front line. It's yeah. not the main street. Oh, it's, oh, okay, I see yeah. it. Okay. Further discussion on the uh, main motion? Yes, Ms. Doctor. Uh, Nancy, Dr. Precinct One. I, if I could go back just for a quick question for uh, 5.6.8.3B, number one, about the minimum 10% units. It's just, just a question because it's not consistent with the other um, parts, I guess, of the town being 25%. It's a legal question. Is there any ramification that a developer could use that as a basis for asking for 10% then in another part of town? Not that I'm aware of. Well, I was asking town council because he's, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> town council. Does that, does that, is that something that we should be concerned about? What are you, what are you contemplating that the, the, the developer would ask for? That um, you do for put the ten percent someplace else. Yes. Well. In the town. Yeah. Because it's not a consistent policy, and I thought we were trying okay, to be so, consistent. So. This does not contemplate that that would be permissible. No. So that so protects. The ten percent has to be on the site. And it can't be used as a um, justification in another part of town to um, diminish, to reduce from 25 to 10. Oh, oh, I get it. So, well, of course, people can create whatever they want to create, but um, the. 40-yard district is its own special beast, and um, you would always expect the rules in a 48 district to be different from those generally applicable anywhere else. So somebody can always make a claim that they're being discriminated against on whatever basis they are, but I don't think that's got much merit. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion on the main motion? I see a hand. No? Are we ready for the vote? requires a two-thirds vote, so I would ask my counters if I still have them. Yep. All those in favor, please rise. Thirty-one. Nineteen. Nineteen. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Thirty-one. Thirty-one. And those opposed? Zero. 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 One. One. The vote being 114 in the affirmative, one in the negative, the motion carries. Would, would I hear a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? 
All those in favor of adjourning until Monday evening at 7.30, please raise your hand. And those opposed, and this town meeting stands adjourned until Monday evening.